I think you can see that we've uh, maybe changed the setup a little bit with uh, differences this year than in the past. And we're going to have just kind of little discussions today. Uh, we're, instead of one person giving a presentation after we do the first uh, presentation, we're going to just talk about the issues uh, with people here uh, today. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy that. But the first thing that I want to do is introduce Dr. Jeffrey Dorman, who is the Hugh, Hugh C. Kiger Distinguished Professor of Agricultural and Research Economics at NC State University. Uh, this is going to be the first time Dr. Dorman has uh, joined us for the Ag and Rural Forum, and we've had many uh, enlightening presentations from uh, economists at North Carolina State. Today will be no different. Uh, Dr. Goldman joined NC State in May of 2023. He has uh, been in and met with me, and I have always depended on these NC State economists for forecast and information, and uh, I am so impressed with his background and knowledge of uh, agriculture. He actually earned his bachelor's degree and PhD in agricultural economics from the University of California, Davis, which is a big agricultural school in the United States. Before he joined NC State, he served four years as the state fiscal economist of Georgia and 34 years at the University of Georgia as a professor of agricultural and applied economics. He's got an extensive experience uh, with economics and management of the food industry, ag policy, and the food system. Uh, food system. Uh, what a perfect fit for us in North Carolina. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Dorfman. Businesses into moving here. And when we looked at different states, one of the states 
that we were getting out-competed by, in some ways, was North Carolina. Okay? So, right now, the states that are winning are the states that can get people to move there and take jobs. Unemployment is so low right now that you want to grow, so you pretty much got to steal somebody else's work. Consumer spending. So consumer spending is really sort of a great mystery right now. You see some reports that say it's bad. You see other reports that say it's good. Uh, the latest sort of government report on December's consumer spending was actually considered quite strong. But on the other hand, Bank of America, which how many people in the audience have a Bank of America credit card in their wallet? Okay, I'm not sure you guys understand how raising hands works. <laughs> how many people have a Bank of America credit card in their wallet? Bank of America says credit card spending has only gone up two tenths of a percent in the last year, over an entire 12 month period. Now inflation, as we all know, was a lot more than two tenths of a percent in the last 12 months. So that means people were bringing home less stuff but on the other hand, the government says consumer spending has grown at more like 3% in the last year. So how can, I mean, we're not buying stuff with cash very often anymore. We're not writing checks. We're all using our credit cards. Bank of America has a ton of credit cards. So they have a pretty good idea of what's going on. So how do we square that circle? I think the answer is that if we look at the data, when, when COVID came along in the first year, federal government passed out trillions of dollars of free money to people, right? And people did three things with that money. They spent about a third of it, they saved about a third of it, and they paid down debt with a third of it. Well, that third they saved amounted to over $2 trillion, and they've been spending it now for two, three years except for the people at the top 10 or 20% of the income distribution, that money is now gone. Right? Banks, banks could look at your checking account balance. And for two years, your checking account balances were all higher than they were before the pandemic. And now, unless you're a rich person, they're back to normal. So I think what's happened is most people have run out of the free money. Inflation is taking its toll, and they're barely hanging on with their spending. Overall spending is still up because the rich people still have money. And it turns out that the rich people actually spend the top, like 10 or 20 percent people spend about 40 percent of the money. Okay, and you know what they do? They have credit cards that aren't Bank of America credit cards. Rich people are spending with their American Express credit cards. Okay, so I think that's what's going on here, and I think what we're seeing now is. A lot of people started to run out of money and just barely managed to hang on with inflation. That's going to hurt some businesses, right? If you're a business that relies on ordinary people and not rich people, times are about to get tough. All right. Here I want to show you three charts to try and explain another sort of mystery. One of the things that you hear if you watch the news or you read the newspapers recently is... Why does everybody think the economy is bad when unemployment is low, consumer spending is growing, inflation is coming down, in particular, President Biden and the people who want him reelected keep complaining that people say the economy is bad, but it's really good, and they blame it on vibes, that people should have bad economic vibes. So I want to know why would we have bad economic vibes. So this first chart is total wages and salaries in North Carolina. Okay, think of this, this is paycheck income, right? This is how most people get their money. Every week, two weeks, or month, somebody deposits money in your bank account and they hand you a paycheck. Okay, so this isn't CEO bonuses, right? These are people's paychecks. And you can see that after COVID happened, it jumps way up. This is percent change. And in fact, what we see is that for the last three years, it's been 5, 10, 15% growth in total wages. So if you look at this, you would say, yeah, they're right. The economy is great. Why could anybody complain? All right, well, the answer is we need to account for inflation, right? 
sure, our wages have been going up, but so is inflation, so is the cost of everything we buy. So if I adjust the charge for inflation, we just look at gains in wages minus inflation, well, it's still positive. It's not as high, but it still looks pretty good. So we look at that again and we say, wait, why? Why would anybody be complaining? wages, I adjust for inflation, and I adjust for the number of people working. And once you do that, you see the chart becomes quite negative for all of 2022 and 2023 for the most part. So what's happened is there was so much inflation that the way people kept up is they had to have more people per household essentially working. So you went from a one-income family back to a two-income family. Or the teenager who quit working during COVID had to go back and take a part-time job, right? So the only way people stayed ahead in terms of sort of household purchasing power was by working more jobs. And so sure, people could say, hey, the economy's doing great. People have enough money to cover the inflation. That's true. Wages have gone up enough to cover inflation. but. I think people are right when they say, yeah, but if the way we manage to keep up with inflation is by working more jobs, then I think we're entitled to say that's not the greatest economy in the world. All right, on to inflation. This is sort of a, a, a hopefully we have some good news charts in here and some bad news charts. This one's kind of a bad news chart, but yeah. Inflation is going down, but, People need to understand that inflation going down doesn't mean prices are going down. For most of the stuff you buy, the prices are never going back down. Right? Unfortunately, if you read the little asterisk there, right? Good news on the asterisk, some of the prices that will go back down are fertilizers, chemicals, fuel. Unfortunately, the bad news is the other prices that are going to go back down are agricultural commodity prices. Okay. So hopefully we get fertilizer prices falling fast enough that we can keep returns kind of steady. Okay. All right, so I told you I was going to say, are we going to have a recession or not? Well, who cares? So here's what I'll say about that. I'm an economist. Economists care a lot about whether there's a recession or not. Uh, I've actually published papers on predicting whether there's going to be a recession or not and how to do it. However, normal people don't care. Right? The only people who care are economists and the media. Right? And whatever politic political party's not in power. They care. Okay? But ordinary people care about two things. Do they have a job? And can they afford to buy the stuff they want to buy? Right? Do we have enough income to cover the price of their goods? That's all regular people care about. And those aren't going to be a problem because inflation is slowing down and businesses are scared to fire workers. Okay? Remember what happened in COVID. When we shut down in COVID and businesses laid off workers, they then spent the next two years trying to hire workers back and they couldn't get them. Right? So if a business, if we do have a recession, and business is bad, that business is not going to fire a whole lot of workers. They're going to find stuff for them to do. They're going to say, hey, go paint the storeroom in the back. Go shred some old files, right? We're going to find some make work stuff for people to do, and we're going to store all our good workers so we don't lose them. That means if we have a recession, unemployment will go up a little, but not a lot. Incomes may go down a little, but not a lot. Remember when I told you people used a bunch of the free money during COVID to pay down their credit card debts? Not a debt. So family financial conditions are actually quite good right now. Debt's very manageable. So people will be able to handle a small drop in income and a small rise in unemployment. So if we have a recession, it will be pretty mild. And the reality is for, for anybody who isn't an economist, it isn't going to matter if the economy is growing slowly or shrinking slowly. We're going to be a little above the line. We're going to be a little above, below the line. Most people won't care. All right. 
Let's talk more specifically about agriculture. Okay. The bars you see here are acreages for major North Carolina commodities. Right? We got corn, soybeans, cotton, peanuts, wheat, uh, tobacco on here. The line you see that looks like it's going straight across, that's the total. What I want you to notice here is the total acreage doesn't change. We plant the same amount of acres every year. That means if acres of one crop are going up, they got to steal it from somebody else. Okay? So where are we stealing? Well, this, this numbers, and don't worry about the numbers particularly, um, these are just correlations between the acreage of, of, of those major crops. And highlighted in yellow is the fact that in the column for corn, they're all negative, which means when corn goes up, everything else goes down. When anything else goes up, corn goes down. So corn is the swing commodity, okay? There's other negatives on the chart, so some commodities steal from the other ones too. But in general, the big swing commodity in North Carolina that everybody either loses acres to or steals them from is corn. Okay, so, so what's going on with corn prices? Well, they're going down. Remember, I told you commodity prices were one of the few things going back down. So corn prices are going down, which normally you would think would mean other commodities would have a chance to steal acres from corn. Unfortunately, soybean prices are down too. And importantly, because fertilizer prices are down and corn uses a lot of fertilizer, corn returns are not falling nearly as much as corn prices. Okay? So I think corn is probably going to be more competitive than it looks just by that price chart. And I actually think what we're going to see in 2024 is plantings look a lot like they did in 2023. I don't expect to see any big shifts between commodities. I think we're kind of going to have to stay All right, labor costs. Everybody in North Carolina agriculture is talking about labor costs. Everybody's worried about the H-2A classification problem. Nobody's happy to use H-2A workers about the 90 cent an hour increase. We've, we've had the commissioner and the Department of Agriculture put on symposiums about it. Lots of informational sessions, trying to get people to understand what's going on. Um, it's definitely an issue, and it varies by crops, right? I did a little looking the other day, obviously, some people don't use any H-2A labor, but they still do use labor, and they're paying those workers more. We have some crops where labor costs are only moving your per acre returns by one or two percent. So you're making one or two percent less money because of increases in labor costs. But we have other ones where it's like a 15 percent hit to returns. Okay. So we are reaching a point where high labor co crops are at a severe disadvantage, we're also definitely at a point where H-2A only makes sense if those workers can be used on multiple commodities. Right? You can't bring workers in just to work tobacco and then send them back home. Won't cover all the fixed costs. So either, either you have to grow multiple commodities you can use those workers on, or you gotta go through a contractor that's sharing them out between different farmers, right? To make it all more efficient. Definitely something we need sort of a long-term solution for soon. Input prices. Talked a little bit about fertilizer and, and fuel prices being things that are coming back down. Here's the chart. Fertilizer price on the top. Crude oil prices on the bottom. You can see they're going down. Now, fertilizer prices are still double what they were four or five years ago, which is bad. But at the peak on that chart, fertilizer prices were up 400%. So double is a lot better than that. All right, risk. What could, I think overall we're not gonna see big changes in acreage. I don't think we'll see huge changes in returns. So I think we'll pick up a little bit on the input price side to make up for what we'll lose on the you know, gross sales side. Um, 
what could make me wrong? What could mess up 2024 North Carolina agriculture? I think the two big risks we have are China and a global recession. So if the US gets in another trade spat with China, and China decides to retaliate for something that we do by putting tariffs on US ag imports or just not buying them, right? Um, that hurts, okay? And it hurts particular commodities, right? So for example, tobacco, one that takes a bigger hit than others. Then in terms of a global recession, if there's a recession in the US, it doesn't really matter for agriculture. Americans are rich enough that in a recession, not in a recession, we still buy food, okay? But in the rest of the world, if their incomes drop, they buy cheaper local foods, right? American food is a luxury good in a lot of the world, okay? So we've got to hope that the rest of the world hangs on and does okay. Um, with consumer spending struggling, one of the sort of canaries in the coal mine that we look for is restaurant spending. So far, restaurant spending has held up pretty well. But if the economy slows more and restaurant spending does fall, that hits our vegetable farmers hard. I don't think even most ag economists realize until we shut all the restaurants down at the start of the pandemic, but apparently, no American eats any vegetables at home. <laughs> All the vegetables that get sold are sold to restaurants. It's unclear that we eat vegetables in the restaurants either, but they put them on the plate. Okay. So when we shut down, the, the demand for vegetables just collapsed. Right? So, we need, so if people eat out less, it's going to hit vegetables harder. Fruits, right, like our North Carolina apples, will do a little better than vegetables because we do eat fruit at home, apparently. Um, I don't know if that's just sticking apples in your kid's lunch bag at school um, or not. I know I eat an apple pretty much every day, so I'm doing my part of the fruits, and I do eat some vegetables, too, even when I'm home. But that's apparently rare, right? So, so but we'll see this. So I think things that are sold in restaurants more have more risk this year, and things that we actually eat at home should hold up better. All right, best practice. So what can you do in conditions like this? I'd like to give people a few tips and a, and a lesson or two if I can. Um, right? Capture as much of the value added of your products as you can. Right? Today, American farmers get 20 cents or less of every food dollar. We're not getting 20 cents or less of every food dollar because farmers are somehow being, you know, ripped off by powerful big food companies. It's because the food sold in the grocery stores is so much more processed than it used to be, right? Instead of buying whole chickens, now we buy boneless, skinless, teriyaki marinated chicken breasts. Right? I mean, that's a thing. It's tasty. We make that out of North Carolina chicken. Like, it's okay to buy that. But it means that, the, that farmers get less money, right? You can buy your fruit and vegetables at the grocery store already cut up. I don't understand why. I own knives. You probably own knives. But people do, right? Because we're busy is the answer to why. We're busy, so we're pegging for the convenience. And that goes into the food prices. Okay? But if you want to capture more of those food dollars, you've got to do some of that. So add the convenience, add the value added. Do whatever you can do along those lines. Um, if you grow something that you can do direct to consumer sales, do it. And if you are doing that, I've already done my first pick your own apples here in North Carolina. Drove out to Morrisville with my, my wife back in the fall. We had a great time. Okay? You should do that. Every apple picking season, right? Don't just sell your products, though. Sell the experience. My daughter is an agritourism fanatic, okay? 
she and her husband go all the time to local farms where they can pick your own stuff. Is she there because she really wants to pick a bunch of apples? No, she's there so she can take some pictures. <laughs> right? So embrace that, right? Charge people to give them good stuff for their Instagram feed. This farm she goes to in Maryland actually charges more if you want to go at twilight because the light's better for the pictures. Okay, that low angled sun gives you the best pictures for your Instagram feed. So you gotta think about this stuff. Okay, don't just have a pick your own, right? But have a pick your own where you're charging people to have a nice backdrop or be there at the right time. Make sure you're selling apple pies, apple turnovers, apple jam, apple everything else in a store right there because that's the value added. And then you can see on the slide, your got to be North Carolina logo, right? Anytime you can brand your stuff, you will make more money. Programs like this that your Department of Agriculture runs are fantastic and do great things for North Carolina farmers. Okay, Georgia has a similar program. We call ours Georgia Grow. Right? So you need to be doing things like this. All right. And that is it. I think I have a minute or two left of my time. So if there is there are any questions, if not, you see my email is on there. If you can't remember or write down the email, if you Google me, I'm either the first or the second Jeffrey Dorfman that pops up. And it's pretty easy to tell me apart from the cosmetic dentist in New York City. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. My, my takeaway is that uh, even though a lot's changed, uh, a lot remains the same, and it, it seems that a good, sharp pencil and uh, a lot of information is what uh, is going to be important for success uh, this coming year, as it's always been. And I, I wanted to respond just a little bit to that uh, question that you have. We have uh, worked with the legislature uh, on present use value for farmland, and there are also a lot of things that we have done uh, with agritourism that uh, give you some opportunities that you would not have if you weren't agriculture. So the 
If you have any questions uh, like that, if you would uh, call the department, that's what we're here for is to help you be successful. Okay, now we're going to have a panel that's going to be uh, led by Beth Farrell of the Department of Ag. And Beth is a member of my executive management team. And, uh, coming up with a job description for her or a lot of the employees is difficult because we have to be very fluid uh, as issues change. Their job responsibility change, but uh, she is a leader in the department. And uh, she's going to lead a panel discussion on local food purchasing program and their impact on small farms in North Carolina and communities. Uh, the misconception out there is that we are, have nothing but large farms in North Carolina. And the truth of the matter is we are a small farm state. Uh, the majority of our farms are uh, under uh, 100 acres, and a large majority are under 500 acres. So we've got this diversity and mixture of farms in North Carolina, and I think that's, that's what makes it successful. And one thing that came out of the, uh, the pandemic was the, the importance of a local food economy uh, and having that to depend on. So, uh, Beth, I'm going to ask that you lead this discussion, and I think it will be very important. Thank you, Commissioner Troxler, and I believe it's listed in my job duties as other duties as assigned. <laughs> and y'all, I see there's a large group in the back that we have seats towards the front. Please come have a seat. That We're looking forward to this conversation. I promise I see people at about every table I know and they don't bite. So today we're going to talk about a couple of major short-term food purchasing programs that are giving opportunities primarily focused on small and socially disadvantaged farmers. These programs are being funded by federal dollars, but the Department of Agriculture has been tasked with organizing and implementing these efforts. We were told by USDA exactly how much money North Carolina would be receiving for each of these programs. Then we had to develop and plan on exactly how we would use these funds to purchase local foods to distribute communities and families in need. And the real challenge in that is how do you create win-win? How do we benefit the farmers? How do we benefit the communities? How do we make sure these programs are successful and develop a plan that can be implemented in the state? Even though you may see a press release about programs like this from USDA, as soon as these funds are announced, it takes a whole lot longer to get these in place. It takes literally months, I think, the first conversation we had about LFPA was right before Thanksgiving in 2021. And it took until December of 2022 for that plan to be approved so that we could move forward. And there's a whole lot to navigate through. I mean, you got to keep in mind, federal funds are taxpayer dollars. We need to make sure that there's complete accountability. And I can say for LFPA and LFPA Plus, the reporting requirement is tremendous there is an Excel spreadsheet that literally says what was purchased from what farmer at what, what county, drills down, and then where was that food distributed? How did it reach the communities in need? That there is tons of reporting that we have to give back on a quarterly basis. The last one had over 20,000 entries. These are tremendous programs. And while we're so excited about this opportunity to be able to pay farmers a fair market value, for what they're producing, we also have to remain aware that this could have unintended consequences when these programs end. What happens if a farmer scales up to be able to fill the market demand for this program, and then in 2025, it just goes away completely? So we've invited some of our lead partners on the Local Food Purchasing Assistance Program to help tell you more about these programs. And Archie Hart is with me today, and he's our Director of Small End Farms, to help share about the challenges and opportunities that this is creating across the state. You've probably noticed that the government uses a whole lot of acronyms. It is basically alphabet soup. So we're going to call this LFPA and LFPA Plus as we go forward. And first, I want to introduce Roland McReynolds, the Executive Director of Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. Roland and I have had the opportunity to work and collaborate on so many projects over the years. When we first heard about LFPA, 
and it's funded through ARPA, so keep all this in mind too. So it's American Recovery, or excuse me, American Rescue Plan Act, again, alphabet soup, that we begin having conversations with stakeholders across the state. And every one of those conversations came back to CFSA and the existing farm share program that was created during COVID. And so, Roland, we really appreciate this opportunity to help fund that with an additional $7.6 million, and we look forward to you telling us more about that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth. I uh, really do appreciate the partnership with the department that has helped this program be successful. Um, and so I will just start by, you know, as Dr. Dorfman, you know, talked about, uh, people stopped eating vegetables because people stopped going to restaurants because restaurants were closed in March of 2020. <laughs> Um, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association is a farmer member organization. Our members are small farmers. Overwhelmingly, they're grossing less than $250,000 a year, and the overwhelming majority of them grow fruits and vegetables, and especially vegetables. And many of them sell those vegetables to restaurants through community-based, uh, locally, local community-based distribution businesses. Uh, that can be for-profit or private or, or non-profits or even government partnerships, but you know, that we refer to as food hubs, local businesses that are focused on serving small farms in the local community. So those farmers and those food hub businesses were looking at March 2020 just losing all their customers. Um, and so the, the farmers obviously had vegetables in the ground that they had planted and expecting to sell to restaurants. So recognizing that this was an issue for our members, uh, at CFSA we were able to raise some philanthropic dollars, uh, thanks to Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation and thanks to Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, to raise money uh, to provide funds to those food hubs for them to buy food from their regular suppliers and then turn around and initially give that food away to restaurant workers who were out of work because of COVID. Uh, very quickly, you know, the shift, it, it shifted away from that market as restaurants started to come back and it became more selling or giving that food away through local food pantries and community-based distributors, pantries, senior centers, YMCA programs, and so forth. So uh, the program was successful, as Beth uh, talked about, when, uh, the, when the state had ARPA funds to spend uh, uh, in the 2022 budget. The state was, uh, was able to provide $2 million to the program to, through the Department of Agriculture for our farm share program. We were able to work even more closely together, add more farms, increase the number of sales. And so for the first three years of 2020 through 2022, you know, we, uh, our pro the farm share program paid almost $3.35 million to food hubs and small farm businesses across North Carolina. So distributing 85,000 boxes of food to people, to hungry people in need, and that included 715,000 pounds of produce and um, 70 tons of proteins, all grown on small-scale North Carolina farms. Um, so when the USDA's local food procurement or purchase assistance program came out, LFPA, um, it was a natural fit for the department to, to uh, talk with us about funneling those additional funds into the farm share program and with USDA wanting to see a documented uh, in, uh, improvement in the uh, participation of socially disadvantaged farms in the program and more assurances that hungry people are getting this food from their community farms. So uh, we've been able, the program, after a long gestation period that Beth described, we were finally able last year, about starting in March or April, to start purchases with, the, with this new um, LFPA money. And over the 20, course of 2023, we spent almost two, over $2.1 million just in one year to purchase 48,000 boxes worth of food half a million tons of produce and 22 tons of proteins, I'm sorry, uh, half a million pounds of produce and 22 tons of proteins, and 300 farmers were participating in that program, got, per, got sales through this program, and we are paying a price that is more comparable to retail. It is not, this is the price that is based on the econ economics of a small farm and the, the different economies of scale that, that they have. Um, and so now these operations uh, have been able to, uh, and the food hubs that they're working with have been able to strengthen and to increase their partnerships. And so this is building the capacity. Uh, every single one of the farms participating in this program has a food safety policy. 
and they have training, and so they're preparing themselves to get into other markets participating with the food hubs. And it's this coordination of all these community partners that are partners of agriculture and our partners who are helping with training at NC State, at NCA, NC State University, to ensure that we're putting these farmers and food hubs in positions to succeed in the future. Thank you, Roland. That we really appreciate all the efforts of you and your teams and those community partners that you've developed across the state to help address need and provide market opportunity. We're also joined by Mike Darrow, Executive Director of Feeding the Carolinas. Mike is a partner with the seven major food banks across the state that work to feed communities in need. We got notified that there was going to be an additional $11.1 million come out for LFPA Plus. So back to alphabet soup. But LFPA Plus is different than LFPA in that it's being funded by the Commodity Credit Corp, which puts very strict stipulations on what can be purchased. So for example, Roland and his team with LFPA could push, purchase local sausage to distribute. For what Mike is doing, sausage is processed and that it can't be utilized for that program which also leads to confusion because it's about the same name about the same program but much different parameters and so Mike we look forward to hearing about how how you and the food banks are working with this program thank you Beth um, yeah I'm Mike Darrow I'm the executive director of Feeding the Carolinas and so we're in the round two of this we're um, both under the, the same contract but this is kind of the second round that we were added to, and so uh, we're a, a nonprofit association that works with the, uh, the Feeding America Food Banks across the Carolinas, seven, as Beth mentioned, in North Carolina. These are, I call them the capital F, capital B food banks, they're the multi-million dollar distribution centers, and underneath them is a network of independent food pantries, and those are the church pantries and the community centers and those kind of things. Roughly, pre-pandemic, about 2,700, that number's probably lower now. So, um, we literally feed the Carolinas, that's what we do, and, you know, during the pandemic, the same kind of thing happened to us. We had to, you know, shift dramatically. The restaurants that were closing and, and all that produce had to go somewhere, and so our whole Farm to Food Bank program where we source produce just exploded, and so, you know, in a strange way, we, we benefited from that in terms of getting produce out um, within the Carolinas and even across the nation. As, as we helped to feed people. Um, and so now, the LFPA Plus program, um, we're picking, picking that up. As Beth mentioned, it's a, it's a little bit tighter. There's no admin support at all, and so we're just absorbing that so the food banks don't have to. And so we are the, the fiduciary agent, which means that you, from USDA, NCAG will request pull down of money for it, and then we'll request it to us and then we give it to the food banks to, to manage along the way. And so we have a grants manager that's managing all that. Um, the interesting thing about LFPA Plus for a food bank is that while it's another way to provide food to those in need, and, and by the way, the number of people seeing food banks right now is higher than it was at the height of the pandemic. Just so. And so the, the difference with the LFPA Plus is that it's not a food insecurity grant necessarily, it's a local farmer support grant. So we had to kind of shift our brains a little bit on how we do that. And it's a very local program, which I love, because local problems, local solutions. And so we're just starting um, and, and getting going, ramping up. Uh, the last, um, right now we've spent about $200,000 working with 25 farmers, so we're just kind of ramping up as we go. Mike, we really appreciate what you and your team are doing, that we know that this is stretching the box for these food banks. And they're having to think about food purchasing in a completely different manner. And really appreciate you working with us so that we can get through those hurdles for, for true benefit. So y'all, we've talked about about $18 million in federal funding to support local food purchases. Keep in mind, these funds all go away in October of 2025. Keeping all this in mind, it's important to understand the opportunities and challenges that this is presenting small farmers across the state. And what's going to happen to them if these programs just go away? 
So I want to introduce Artie Hart, our Director of Small and Minority Farms at the Department of Agriculture. Artie and his team do a fantastic job working with small farms across the state. And like so many of my colleagues at the Department of Agriculture, they're so busy helping others and getting work done that they seldom make the headlines. Archie, can you share about the impact these programs are having on small and minority farms, both in participating in what may happen if the funding ends? challenges uh, for the small and uh, limited resource farmers, but the first challenge I'm going to have to admit to you all right now is that light over there. <laughs> it is shining directly in my, in my eye. So uh, if I run into a table after this, you know why. So what are the challenges? We often hear about middle supply chain. And when I started in agriculture, that was basically called um, post-harvest hamper. Uh, Dr. George Wilson uh, was one of my instructors or specialists uh, in that field from NC State, a corporate extension uh, specialist. Um, and when we look at the uh, infrastructure, and this is one of the challenges, <laughs> is infrastructure. Because small farmers can just about grow anything, but there's challenges as far as infrastructure in that middle supply chain or post-harvest handling area. Part of that infrastructure uh, needs are to take out or remove the field heat, whether it's hydro, whether it's uh, ice, whether it's heat. Those are the challenges that we're going to have to have to, to be able to get on the farm or to get with cooperatives who are trying to
Archie, thank you for team for what you do every day. That as a part-time small farmer, I understand a lot of the challenges out there and you hit a lot of good things that really are needed in our state. And we could literally spend hours talking about these programs and, and other ways that we could help small farms across the state. And I want you to be aware though before we wrap up of a couple of additional programs being managed by the Department of Agriculture. We received notification this week that the local Food for Schools program managed by our Food Distribution Division has been granted a one-year no-cost extension to continue providing school park cafeterias with the best and freshest local food available. And additionally, and this speaks to Archie's point about middle of the supply chain, we've just been notified by USDA that we're, we are receiving $7.4 million for the Resilient Food Systems Infrastructure Program to enhance the middle of the supply chain areas in our state. This will be transformational. We're in the process and we'll be hiring four program positions to be able to work with Archie and his team to make sure that we are making meaningful, long-lasting impact across the state. I want to thank all of our speakers today for your work in helping connect communities in need to local food and for working with small farmers. We know the diversity of North Carolina agriculture helps us feed, feed us and the world. And I want to challenge you all to look and shop local. We talk about that all the time. But go to your farmer's markets, take advantage of the agritourism opportunities. Because if we want these farms to be successful long term, it's going to be reliant on all of us to have a part in that. Thank you. Is this on? Okay, it is on. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Sandy Stewart. Um, I currently serve as president of Sand Hills Community College, and and previously, many of you know, I served as assistant commissioner for Commissioner Troxer, director of research stations before that. And uh, and I know two things, Commissioner. The first is that you don't get agriculture out of your blood. So I appreciate the invitation to be here this morning. The second thing is you never stop working for Steve Troxer. And so, uh, so thank you for the invitation. And we're going to have a little conversation about the state of agriculture in North Carolina and, uh, and really get a chance to hear the commissioner's thoughts about where we are, some things about where we've been, and, and some things about where we are going in this state. So, um, so commissioner, you look out here, and I saw people coming in, a lot of people I know, and they, they come from from the coast, they come from the Piedmont, a few from the Sand Hills. We got folks in the mountains. We have a fantastic place to live in North Carolina, and people have discovered that. So we're not only a top 10 agricultural state, we're a top 10 state in terms of population growth. And that has a lot of implications when you have that many mouths to feed, and, and we're dealing with the largest industry in our state today. So. So if you could, let's just start there. Let's talk a little bit about that and, and, um, and, and, and what that means for agriculture. Well, first of all, there's one thing that I never got across to you. What is your real title, sir? Is it Dr. Sandy Stewart? You are correct. Uh, you know, I paid you a lot of money to be that smart, so you need to let people know that you worked that hard to get that doctor's degree. I appreciate you delivering that message. <laughs> You know, uh, I think the, the cat's out of the bag, and for a long, long time, those of us that have lived in North Carolina have known what a wonderful place this is, you know, from a, a business standpoint, an agricultural standpoint, and, and then you look at the aesthetics of North Carolina, the, the mountains, the, the coast, the Piedmont. Uh, I've, I have been all over the world, and I've never seen anything else like North Carolina, and so this is home. Uh, but now it's home to a lot more people. Uh, and if you tried to get with, uh, come with me from Brown Summit, North Carolina, north of Greensboro to uh, 
here this morning, I think you would understand that change. Uh, it took us an extra 45 minutes to get here this morning, and unfortunately, I have a live radio show to do at a certain time, and we did not get here on the time. So that's the new experience in North Carolina, but it points out uh, just how many people are moving into the state. Uh, and if you look at uh, some of the national statistics, uh, Raleigh is the number two fastest growing city in the whole nation. Uh, Charlotte's number six. Uh, North Carolina as a whole, I think, ranks number three in the nation as far as the number of people that were moving in here. So if you're dependent on natural resources like we are in agriculture, certainly there's going to be an impact, and we're, we're beginning to really feel that impact in North Carolina. So there's some, some big ticket things that not only we in agriculture, but the whole state of North Carolina and state government and local governments are going to have to address to be able to, to deal with the changes. And of course, the first is infrastructure. And I talked about the traffic. But if you look at the road construction that we're doing across North Carolina, uh, we're still going to be behind even when we get this, uh, this construction done. It, it's a, almost a never-ending process, and you can't build a road overnight. So transportation infrastructure is something that we certainly are going to have to address. And think back to when we started building roads. Uh, we built roads in the beginning primarily to get products from the farm to the markets across the state. So anything that impacts uh, transportation infrastructure certainly impacts uh, North Carolina. And I look at uh, the, the things that happen even when you do a designation for a uh, uh, interstate highway, you know, immediately it changes the weights on the highways and certainly trying to put a tractor or a combine on a, a busy four lane highway is a suicidal operation to begin with. So, well, we've got to deal with that. Uh, one of my worries, and it's, a, it's kind of a big ticket item, and it comes from experience, is uh, I think it started about 2007 when we had the first major drought in North Carolina. And uh, it, there was a point between 2007 and 2011 that uh, I think Raleigh got down to a 30-day water supply. Now, how many people have we moved into this area since then? And have you seen a new reservoir being built anywhere? So, in the back of your mind, it's raining now. And, and we, we're going to couple this, this water message with the flood message that you're going to hear uh, here this morning. But uh, those kind of big ticket items are things that, uh, that we're going to have to deal with. Did any of you have a uh, uh, blackout? Not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before that. Uh, it was cold now, and, and the power went off, and it had to be cut off to protect the grid. But where's the power going to come from? Uh, we're plugging up electric vehicles every day, uh, so there's going to have to be some more power created in North Carolina from some source. And uh, you, basically, you know, solar is a great technology as a supplement. Uh, wind's kind of the same way, but you've got to have a reliable support, a reliable uh, source of electricity. So is it going to be fossil fuels, or the other choice is the new uh, package plants that are nuclear. Uh, it's, uh, so that's a, another discussion but, from, but it, in itself, but we know that agriculture runs on energy. Uh, I mean, we do every day, so all of these are big ticket items that we in some way have got to influence the, the lawmakers to keep agriculture at the front of their minds because we are the people that feed everybody. So, you know, these are some of the things, and we'll get into farmland preservation uh, in a little bit later, but that, you know, that's always been at the forefront of my policy, but it's a, it's a big, big issue now. Well, Commissioner, it that, all of that is exactly right, and you did mention farmland preservation, and you know that's one of the implications of when we build, when we build out new neighborhoods, when we build out, you know, the the, the urban and suburban areas of our state. Um, it's a lot of times it's taken up farmland, and uh, and North Carolina has some dubious distinctions in that area. But I know it's dear dear to your heart. You've been doing a lot of work in that area, so can 
you talk a little bit about the Farmland Preservation? When I came into office, uh, I had farmed in uh, the shadow of Greensboro basically all my life, so I know, you know, what urban encroachment looks like. Uh, in a lot of cases, I was farming, uh, the farm would run right up to the yard of a, a, a person that was in a subdivision or, you know, a private house, so, you know, I had a little understanding of that. But more and more, I saw the farmland that I had to have to, to make a living disappear. So since I came into office, it's been a priority to have a robust uh, farmland preservation program. And, uh, and I think we've done a great job of what we've had to, uh, to work with. We protected about 34,000 acres of farmland uh, with conservation easements. And I see DeWitt Hardy sitting here. He is the, was the original architect of this program. And now I've got Evan Davis. Evan, stand up with that bright coat and shirt on. <laughs> that shirt says Forever Farms. Uh, that's what we are looking for uh, in North Carolina and protecting the farmland. And it's not easy. Uh, as land prices go up, it takes more and more money to protect the local farmland. So the price for protecting farmland is going up. The rate that we're losing it is going up. So it's a big job. Uh, the, the American Farmland Trust says that we rank number two in the nation and the probability of the disappearance of farms between now and 2040. Um, we've got about 8.3 million acres of farmland in North Carolina right now. And on the low side, they say we will probably lose 1.1 million acres of that. Uh, on the high side, maybe more like 1.6, 1.9 million acres. Now that's a million acres we're talking about. That changes the whole perception of North Carolina. It changes the vision of North Carolina. So it's, it's farms that we're protecting, but a farm is so much more than just what you think of as uh, producing the food. We actually, in farm and forestry in North Carolina, sequester 26% of all the carbon emissions that the state puts out, 26%. So every time we take a farm away and a forest away, then we have changed the, you know, that, that climate balance of sequestering on car, uh, CO2. But it also is open space, it's wildlife habitat, uh, it's a place where water percolates uh, into the ground instead of running off and, and causing flooding. And we're going to get into a whole flood discussion uh, in just a few minutes. But protecting farmland is paramount to all these issues. But for protecting one farm, you get so many different things that are good for North Carolina. But to kind of put it in perspective, in Chatham County, there's a great big development going in down there. And I think it's the uh, development itself is 8,500 acres. And then there's another great big chunk, maybe 3,000 acres, that's going into a major, is it battery manufacturer? Or band pass. Yeah. So while we have worked our butts off, excuse that, but it's the truth, uh, to protect 34,000 acres farmland, we're going to lose 11,500 acres just like that. So that, that's the type of job that we are looking at having to do to protect this farmland. I wonder when that balance is going to be hit when we don't have enough natural resources to be successful and, and heaven forbid don't have the natural resources to feed ourselves. The last thing that we want to do is to be dependent on another country so we're going to try to keep that effort up to protect the farmland. The, the legislature did uh, allocate $25 million this past legislative session to, uh, to farmland preservation. But when I look at some of the things that other states have had to do to protect it, uh, that's not nearly enough money. Uh, New York found out that New York City was not going to have uh, good water quality or maybe supply if they didn't protect the farmland in northern uh, New York State. They spent over $250 million protecting farms up there. Uh, you look at the states that have these really robust programs to protect farmland, the reason being they've already lost the most of it. 
So we got to be smarter than that in North Carolina. We got to get ahead of the curve and make sure that this hundred and three billion dollar industry we got continues to grow and thrive. Absolutely, and I think we can all. And, and they're, they're the acres, so it's a, so a lot of what that implies too is that the acres that are left, Commissioner, we have to be more productive with. And, um, and, and just, you know, one statistic that's always just really stood out to me is that, is that if you compare the United States to about 1965 or so, we produce twice as much milk with half, less than half the dairy cows in this country. And that doesn't happen without advances in agricultural research. So that's part of the key as well, isn't it? You know what absolutely is? I, I look at uh, the graphs of uh, corn yields and soybean yields and wheat yields over the past 20 years, and it's an astounding success story. The graph is, is, would be just about like that. Uh, and that's what we had to do to meet worldwide food needs and the, the needs here. But the weather hadn't changed that much. I mean, you hear all the things, the changes in weather, the, cl the climate's warming, it's going to get wetter, but it, that's not the difference in productivity. The difference in productivity is agricultural research, and you can track it from the time that we started really doing agricultural research and, and upping productivity to where we are today. Uh, we can't stop doing this research, y'all. Uh, the one thing that I know is the microbes and uh, the diseases, uh, they don't rest. Uh, we think we've got something under control, another one pops up, so we've got to stay ahead of the curve as far as uh, our productivity and being able to handle these situations as they arise, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, in partnership with uh, NC State University and a &T State University, we operate research farms all over North Carolina that can emulate climates basically from probably northern Florida to the Midwest. So we can do the research on things that might happen in the future, but we've got to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, if something new that pops out, if you don't have the research, you're behind the curve. So uh, that agricultural research has got to continue. It's, uh, we're riding the wave of agricultural research and productivity right now, and, and that's got to continue. Uh, and if there's not a major event that takes a lot of population out of the world, they're predicting we're going to have to have 75, 80, 100 percent more food by the year 2050. That's not that far off. So I want you to remember what I say. Hungry people are mean people. We have a really good economic opportunity with this growth in population to feed people and, and be successful in agriculture. But we also have a moral responsibility. Uh, that's where the feeding programs that you heard about uh, today uh, are about. Uh, but it's also, you know, a worldwide thing. And it, can I, uh, the next world war, can it be fought over food? You better believe it. Uh, it's happened in the past, and, and we've got to have that agricultural productivity and, and have the ability to trade these goods all across the world without interference and tariffs and, and barriers, but that's not the case. The, the uh, Commissioner, you mentioned those research stations. I see Dean Gary Fox here from NC State, and Greg Owens uh, with A&T, and probably others in several research station superintendents. That is a powerful engine we have in North Carolina because along that same, roughly the same latitude, we can we can emulate so many climates. And so there's a lot of, I think we probably, when I worked with the research stations, 90 plus commodities or so, we, we had some kind of work going on on those 18 research stations, as well as the field labs at NC State. So uh, that, that's pretty remarkable, but that reflects North Carolina agriculture. It really does. It, the diversity across this state is one of our strengths. And, um, and I think it's, we say that a lot, Commissioner, but, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's something that we don't really explain sometimes how important that diversity is. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the diversity that we have from southeastern North Carolina to the highest mountains in North Carolina, it, it, it does lend itself to a lot of diversity in, in agriculture. And, 
I take great pride in the ranks that we have in the nation as far as uh, growing commodities, and there are so many things that people probably don't think about that, uh, that we're doing. But, uh, you know, you look at uh, our agricultural production, and we're beginning to get more into orchard production uh, on the coast, and that is a great thing. Uh, but then you just keep going around the state and looking at uh, jalapeno peppers, the top five. <laughs> Cucumbers, top five. How about trout? Number two in the nation for the production of trout. Christmas tree, number two. The best Christmas tree grown anywhere or right here in North Carolina. And if you don't believe it, we rank number one in the nation in putting Christmas trees in the White House through competition. And the only reason we don't do it every year is the judges make a mistake every now and then. But, you know, that's just Of, of who we are and, and why this is so important, not only to North Carolina, to the nation. Uh, protein production, uh, we probably are, are not outranked by anybody in total protein production. So all of this fits together and to say uh, we need to be proud, but we need to keep working to make sure that we don't fall flat because of changes that are happening with population changes and and anything that happens that affects agriculture. Glad you mentioned the Christmas trees. I used to tell people we might be number two in Christmas trees, but we're number one in the Christmas trees you won't actually have. So, <laughs> so the, the, but with, you know, that diversity though, with all that, I didn't know the jalapeno pepper thing. That, that's a new one on me right there. And so you, um, you know, you learn something every day and those, but those products, we've got an opportunity to add value to those products as well with food manufacturing. So that's an important part of the future of agriculture in North Carolina, isn't it? You know, I, I heard Dr. Gorman talking about adding value to products. Uh, and uh, the one thing that has always stuck in my mind about value added was something Dean Richard, uh, Richard Nunn said one time. He said, you know, you get a can of beans that cost a dollar in the grocery store. He said there's probably 10 cents worth of beans in that can of beans. Uh, we want to capture that 10%, certainly at the farm level, but then the, the spread between the 10 cents and the dollar is where a lot of value added is. So we not only want to grow it, uh, we want to process those beans, we want to can those beans, we want to make the can that the beans go into. Uh, we want to make sure that North, North Carolina companies are transporting the product uh, to the wholesale end of it, uh, we want the wholesale end of it, but then we also want to make sure we get that retail in. So you build from 10 cents to a dollar by value adding. Uh, several years back, we had a uh, initiative uh, where the governor's task force on food manufacturing got together, and uh, it was a great exercise bringing together different state agencies and uh, different groups uh, to figure out just how can we bring more food manufacturing into North Carolina. And it was a great exercise. And, uh, you know, it, it once again proves what partnerships and collaboration can do. But from that, there were a couple of things that happened. Uh, we now have the North Carolina Food uh, Processing, the Food Innovation Lab in Kannapolis that's uh, run by NC State. But that was actually a in the beginning, to get that thing established, it was a, a strong partnership between the department and, uh, and NC State to work through that. That thing was a game uh, They have got more companies coming in here to make innovative products than you can, can ever imagine. But the thought behind that is, once we get those companies here to help them with these innovative products, we want them to build that manufacturing right here in North Carolina close to the farms that we would be supplying the products that go into the, the new product. Uh, and it's worked well. Uh, a new initiative that we have in the department that I'm really proud of is I have always wanted to have uh, money uh, in our uh, agricultural development uh, business section to be able to entice companies to come in. Uh, we now have $10 million this year and $10 million next year to be able to do this. Uh, this is going to be, I think, a great boost uh, to that food manufacturing initiative. 
uh, and Peter Thornton and his group and marketing uh, will be heading that up. But it's, I'm kind of a big idea guy, and, and my big idea has become my staff's big problem. Uh, but I've got some big ideas and things I think we can do uh, in, in enticing uh, money, this, in companies with this money. Uh, I think that it would be really good if we use North Carolina milk and dairy products uh, in our school systems. Uh, I think we can do that. I think we can do that and also manufacture cheese and ice cream uh, in the time the school's not in and put, uh, put the Got to BNC logo on it, begin that uh, process again of educating children about healthy eating at a young age. Uh, that's one of the big ideas. And this one is difficult because there is a thing called the Federal Milk Order that kind of stands in the way of some of the innovation that we want to do. But that's one idea. Uh, sweet potato processing. We're, we're the number one sweet potato uh, grower in the nation. Uh, and I think we need a processor for the, uh, the maybe the jumbo potatoes, the, the cold potatoes. But we need to take those sweet potatoes and put them in a can and add value to them once again. So that, that's another one. Um, rendering uh, in North Carolina for the animal industries, uh, I want to enhance that. We're trying to uh, run uh, our animal industries in some cases on the, a rendering industry that's running at 100%. Uh, we need some extra capacity uh, in North Carolina to do that. I hope we can entice that. But there are all kinds of businesses that we can bring to North Carolina with a little enticement. So we're going to see how good a salesman I really am when we start trying to bring these companies in. And the discussions are underway right now. I think we need more to. Well, Commissioner, your big ideas might be the big problems for the staff, but they're the kind of big ideas that move North Carolina forward. I mean, you just you just went down a list of, of big initiatives that really were uniquely suited in North Carolina to follow through with. And, um, and, and you only come up with that kind of thing when you have the kind of experience that you do in agriculture and leading the Department of Agriculture. Uh, think about uh, hurricanes, the floods, avian influenza, uh, wildfires, Western North Carolina, uh, tropical storms, late spring frost, drought, all of those, those kind of things have impacted North Carolina agriculture just, just in the last few years. Um, and then, then there's a biggie, the, the thing that happened in 2020 and how we had to deal with that. So in the next uh, few minutes, if, if we could, I, I think it'd be good to take a look back at some of those lessons that we learned and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the um, about what you see coming on the horizon and how we can apply some of those lessons. So, um, you know, what happened behind the scenes? What what um, what what can we learn from 2020? Well, you know, I've always believed that my public service is a calling to help people, uh, and it's pretty simple on the surface. But little did I know that there would be so much opportunity to exercise that calling. We've had so many uh, major hurricanes and tropical storms, and I think I remember one of the first things that uh, the legislature gave me to do when I just sat down in the seat was to design a disaster relief program for the mountains of North Carolina after two tropical storms had washed them away. Um, we had a little bit of experience with that during Hurricane Floyd, but that was primarily eastern North Carolina and flatland. Uh, and it was primarily U.S. government programs. Uh, so we designed a program, went to the mountains, and found out it would not work. Uh, the, the, the agriculture up there is so different uh, and, and diverse that we actually had to come back, redesign the program, and we sent hundreds of uh, department employees to the mountains to collect the data uh, and be able to uh, have that program in place. Once we got the data, we found out that there was not near enough money to go around. But luckily, uh, then Governor Easley and I had a really good relationship, and I went to him and said, uh, Governor, we got a major problem in the mountains. We don't have enough money, and you got some extra money somewhere you can fly us. 
and he did for some housing money and other programs. So we were able to get this done. And I'll never forget, the checks went out right before Christmas. People were calling the department crying, uh, saying, you know, we can't thank you enough. You have impacted our lives beyond what you'll ever know. Uh, without it, we could not have gone forward. Now, how do you get a better Christmas program than that? So uh, that was just the beginning. And then since that time that we've done the uh, disaster relief program, the massive program we did after Hurricane Florence, it was $240 million. Uh, we have a lot of the department employees involved in that program. Uh, I see Victor Youngblood is here. We actually hired him after he retired from USDA to, uh, to come up with that program. And Sandy actually designed the, the production part of that program. And so it was, a, it was, it was something. Uh, so we've been able to help people get back on their feet. And I think that's a, re a real big, big, big uh, reason that we do have this $103 billion industry now had we not helped people at a time that they couldn't help themselves and certainly it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have happened. But all of that was dwarfed by COVID. Uh, and the experiences that we had then were unbelievable and also the reward for what we were able to do was great. But I knew in the beginning when we started closing restaurants, you heard Roland McGrones talk about that, but we closed restaurants, we closed universities, we closed schools. Uh, so this is our institutional food in North Carolina, and I just want you to know that in normal times, 51% of all the meals eaten in North Carolina are eaten outside the home. So what we were trying to do was shift 51% of the food supply into the grocery store. There was never any way it was going to work, uh, but we did it. So we saw the shortages of products on the grocery shelves, and it was never a farm shortage uh, of these products. There was plenty of pork, there was plenty of beef, there was plenty of milk, plenty of eggs, plenty of everything, but we found out how fragile this food supply really is, and we call it just in time. Uh, and just in time means that grocery shelf gets restocked uh, just in time for the consumers to make sure they have the product, and that did not happen in COVID. So there was a lot of work behind the scenes that had to be done. Uh, I think about trying to make sure that uh, our uh, migrant workers were tested and vaccinated. Uh, we went to the legislature and set up a program to, uh, for farmers to be able to isolate farm workers uh, in the case we did have a, a big outbreak in a camp. Uh, but it even got so much deeper than that that the shortage of product on the shelf was primarily caused by the lack of uh, workers in uh, processing plants across the, the state. So we drew on something that I had brought into uh, a national program and that program was brought in when the Food Safety Modernization Act was put in and was called uh, on farm readiness review. Uh, what we were doing, it was non regulatory, but uh, we went to the farms and, and we worked with people so they understood the regulation, they understood the expectation to help get them in compliance. And, and it became a national program, and I was really proud of it. But we turned around and applied that same logic of educate before you regulate to the processing plants, and we put together a coalition of uh, the department, our uh, meat inspection people, our food safety people, uh, DHHS, uh, the labor, uh, CDC. We went into these processing plants and made suggestions, non-regulatory suggestions about how the plants could improve worker safety and get the, the people back to work with, uh, without the fear of, of, of COVID again. And it worked. Uh, over time, we, we got the supply kind of balanced back up, uh, but it, it took a long time to balance what was institutional food with the, the food supply that uh, people eat at home. Yeah, and, and I remember a lot of those conversations. I remember also, Commissioner, in May of 2020, sitting in regional with you, um, and, and we had we had begun to, to find out and learn how long the wait times were. So if a, if a North Carolina cattleman wanted to get a 
the steer slaughtered, it was more than a year out by, by that time in May of 2020. And so presented with a problem. So we needed to come up with a solution. And, and, and what resulted is we didn't call it MPEC at the time, but that's what it ended up being. It's that MPEC program. Uh, what happened during COVID, uh, it, put a, uh, it put a real strain on lo local food systems. There was much more interest in local foods because uh, some of the food wasn't available on the grocery shelf. So, for instance, if you were uh, a farmer and you had uh, you were raising cattle or you were raising hogs, uh, whatever, sheep, goats, whatever, there was so much interest that there was no, not enough processing capacity local level to be able to do that. So we went to the legislature and uh, they allotted $44 million for us to put this program in to increase uh, efficiency and capacity in local uh, food uh, processing, protein processing, and it was a huge success. I, you know, I've got to say, but to give you an example of how the interest in, especially local proteins has risen, when I became commissioner, I think we had four or five people in the meat handling program that we have in the department. Today it's over 2,000. Uh, but what this allows people to do is to raise these animals on the farm, get them uh, processed locally under their own label, and then be able to sell directly uh, to the public. And it's still inspected protein like you get off of the, uh, the grocery shelf. So, that was a huge problem, a huge success, but uh, that also bred more interest in local protein. So the, the times that we had seen for processing an animal go from a year down to maybe four months, uh, that started to creep up again. So uh, we were successful, but we still haven't hit, a, I think, a happy balance of what we need out there. Yeah, there's, there's more work to be done, really. But the solutions um, that, that, that you've looked at and that you've implemented, not just with the pandemic, but also the other things, we want those solutions. And I think you've always preached this to me and others at the Department of Agriculture. You want it to be safe power. You want it to be something that changes the paradigm over time. And, um, and I think that's important to note, because it's important to note right now, we, we tend to focus on what's right in front of us. And... And, and I, I got to ask you this, Commissioner, there, what's right in front of us as a country, um, it, it's, it, there are a lot of divisions in this country today. Um, and, and I'm sitting on the stage next to a man who's serving his fifth term in statewide elected office. And so I'd like to have your perspective on, on, on that and, and uh, drawing on your experience as Commissioner of Agriculture. Well, you know, uh, First of all, is I've been in public service, and, and like I said, it, to me it's a calling to help people. So it makes it easy every day to solve, help solve problems. But there are things along the way that you learn uh, that uh, are very beneficial. And I, I guess one of those comes from my raising in a small rural community, being raised in a church, uh, and, and that's respecting people. Uh, no matter you know what political party they are, whatever the, the, the divisiveness there is, but if there's respect between two people, you can get things done. Um, you know, I, I guess I can uh, tell a story. My wife may cringe a little bit. She just got me here, but uh, there was a time we had a family vacation at uh, the beach. Uh, all of us were there with the exception of one person, and that was my mother. She had gotten uh, too much age on her to travel much, but she wanted to go to homecoming on, on a Sunday. And I did too. I wanted to hear this retired Methodist minister priest that was my mother's uh, best friend's husband. So I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I drove home, and I helped my mother get ready, and we went to homecoming. And I always tell, I tell you, I was right proud of myself. Uh, I had done that and felt good about it, so we're setting up pretty close to the front of the church. And this retired Methodist minister was preaching on love thine enemy. Well, I get it, I think. But uh, so I'm intently listening to what he said. He turned and he looked right at me and he said, Now, Commissioner, 
I know that may be hard for you, but I hate to tell you this. You're gonna have to work a lot harder because if you want to go to hell, if you want to go to heaven, you gotta do that too. So the best way not to have to love that enemy is don't make enemy. Uh, you know, make partner, uh, love people. So I, I try to use that approach too, and, and it's all about partnerships and relationships. Um, during the uh, the pandemic. Uh, well, this, I guess this was right before the pandemic with the trade war with China. I think everybody knows how important a crop tobacco is uh, to the state of North Carolina. But I had some good friends that had good connections. One was uh, Michael Skews, the uh, commissioner from Delaware. Delaware, North Carolina, now what have we got in common? But he would have been the undersecretary for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and had a great relationship with the trade negotiator from China. So I called Michael up and I said, Michael, I need some help. Uh, I've got to talk to this trade negotiator and see what we can do about these tariffs that are going, that are going to ruin us as far as the export of the back. He said, sure. So I flew up to Delaware and got a face-to-face -face meeting with the trade representative from China I'd have never gotten that had not we been close friends. And, and by the way, we're of different political parties. Uh, but it works. Uh, no matter what, it works. I became close friends with the, uh, with the director of agriculture in Vermont. And once again, Vermont, North Carolina, not a lot in common thing, but two people that are willing to work together. So that, that's, you know, that's what I've learned over time. And uh, that's... Uh, I think that's the reason I have been able to be successful in a lot of different arenas. But even in the international trade, uh, we take trade missions and uh, people uh, with products in North Carolina go with us, and I know a lot of people have been there. If two, if there are two products of equal quality and basically equal price, what's going to sell that product? The relationship between the two people, between the buyer and the seller. And we use that uh, all over the world. And, and tobacco, once again, China Tobacco International is still headquartered here in North Carolina and, and Biden, uh, probably our biggest export customer. Uh, but we spent a lot of time cultivating those relationships. It, the, um, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the Director of Agriculture in Vermont and then Michael Hughes and the the gentleman in Vermont's named Anson Tebbets, and I've had an opportunity to travel. You provided me an opportunity to travel some and be around those folks. And what I found them to be, uh, really, a, they're public servants. And and I don't mind telling this group that um, that they're during my time with the commissioner's assistant, uh, serving as assistant commissioner, we had Hurricane Florence, and and then the COVID deal, both of which were there's no playbook for that. So. So I said, Commissioner, you, you know, what, you, you got any guidance for me here on this? He said, you just get up in the morning and figure out how you can help somebody. And that's, that's, that's the heart of public service. And that's, I think that's what you heard come through with the Commissioner there and, and, and talking about some of his colleagues around the, the country. And, and, um, and, and that sort of segues into this question, Commissioner. You, you serve at the national level with the, national, with the State Departments of Agriculture Association NASTA, you served as president there. Um, Hugh Weathers has got you beat by a few months, is what I've been told. Is the longest serving commissioner in in the country. Hugh Weathers in South Carolina. We're not sure that counts, so we'll just say the commissioner talks. To you. So, um, it, you know, what's that experience on a national level taught you about leadership, and what kind of lessons have you been able to bring back to North Carolina? Well, once again, uh, having relationships uh, across the country to be able to get things done. We, at NASDA, uh, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, we work on ag policy a lot. Uh, things like the Farm Bill that we don't have now and don't know when we don't have, but we do work on those policy items. And to be able to be successful, you've got to lay your politics down at the door. Uh, and everybody is equal. And everybody talks and we solve problems, but that's the only way that it worked. Uh, there was a situation uh, here in North Carolina where we had a large uh, farmer, watermelon farmer, that uh, we had 
done that on-farm readiness review in, uh, in preparation for FDA inspections. And the FDA went in and they did something stupid. Uh, and it was not right, it was not fair, and so I took it to the national level and persuaded all 50 states to stand with us in North Carolina and we would not implement FSMA until they made some concessions about how they're going to treat states. So we had a kind of a uh, standoff for about a year during that period of time and we stood together, but out of that came uh, more common sense regulation for produce across the country. Uh, and this farmer that had the problem in North Carolina in the end is probably the only farmer ever to get an apology from FDA. But that's how you look. Well, well the, uh, you know, you, you have to work that because um, I mentioned the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, NASDA, which is known to most people in, these, in this room, but probably not known to most of the population because the fact of the matter is less than 2% of our population is really involved in agriculture and the food systems. And, um, and so what, what are some thoughts you have on, about that? How do we engage young people to enter agriculture as a career? Um, you know, what are your thoughts there when, when there's so few of us feeding the rest of them? Well, we absolutely are going to have to engage more young people to come into uh, agriculture and agribusiness. And when I say that, uh, part of that, yes, is down to the farm level. And we've got to have young farmers coming back into the business because, uh, you know, a lot of gray hair in ag right now, including myself. But uh, I have thought classes at NC State and a &P State, and I'm amazed, uh, quite frankly, at the, the amount of young talent that's out there and interested, but this is an exclusive business, this ag business. Uh, it's so capital intensive, uh, trying to come up with enough land, uh, and the capital to do it is not easy. So we've got to continually work on programs uh, to help these people get started. Uh, and you mentioned the 2% of us that are really in production agriculture, and it is probably much less than that. I've seen, I've seen figures that say it's getting closer to 1%. So that in itself creates problems. How does 1% or 2% persuade policymakers to do things that are beneficial to those people? Uh, that's a, a, a tough thing to do, but luckily we have strong farm organizations uh, Sean Harding's here with the uh, Farm Bureau. Uh, I know Jimmy Gentry with the Grange is here. And we've got commodity organizations representing all of these different groups. But the one thing that we do to be successful is we stand together. We are partners. Uh, we don't always agree. But when we don't agree, we try to work out the differences and figure out a compromise that will work as far as policy. That, that's, that's our strength and what we've got to do. But there's a correlation, believe it or not, between how many people are really involved in the production of the food supply and the wealth of the, of the, uh, the country. Uh, and it's actually an uh, inverse uh, relationship. In countries where the majority of the people are involved in supplying food for themselves primarily, you don't see a lot of wealth in that country. Uh, in countries like ours, where we have uh, one to two percent of the people involved in the production, it allows 98 percent of the people to go to their strengths and do what they can do best. Uh, and, and it's a good situation. As long as that two percent is good at what they do and they have the policy to be successful. But you know, we, we have that in the United States, we just can't throw it away. Uh, that ability to feed ourselves is our independence and we've got to maintain it. Uh, Commissioner, we, and, and, and a lot of that is uh, the, the, the 2% who, you know, the, the careers in agriculture, it's, it's labor and it's, it's land capital intensive to get involved as a, as, a, as a farmer, but there are so many other opportunities in agriculture, and I can't help myself, I'm sorry, Dean Fox, but I've got to ask about the role the community colleges play in that. We have 58 community colleges in the state. It's probably the most comprehensive system in the entire nation, 
And so uh, I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that person. <laughs> I trained you it's well. That was an opportunity. Uh, you know, I, you know, you being a, co a community college brother now, uh, to me it opens up so many things that we can do uh, in agriculture. I know uh, Sand Hills has a program that uh, is about training golf superintendents and, and people that work on golf courses, and it's uh, in conjunction with the uh, U.S. Golf Association. Uh, agriculture is so technical now. Uh, even to, I would challenge you, if you've never driven a tractor, to go out here to some of these modern tractors and get on it and see if you can even get it running. I mean, I've been there myself, I understand it, but, you know, training people for the technology that we use now on, in, on farms, uh, training people to fix the stuff. Uh, there's a big national discussion about the right to fix, uh, and it's computer driven. So, you have an opportunity, and we have an opportunity to train uh, people that are going to come into agriculture and agribusiness, and if we plan to take that opportunity and run with it, then uh, that's, you know, I think that could become a real strength. That you folks can almost pivot on the dime at a community college as far as changing curricular, uh, changing uh, how you do things. So I think we've got to take advantage of that uh, for the future. And now it's my turn to recruit. Uh, we talk about openings and uh, agriculture. Folks, I need people to work at the Department of Ag. Uh, I've got 300 openings right now, and uh, we're looking for bright people to come in and work. And, and for me to be successful, for the department to be successful, I got to have the best. Uh, you know, I can't scrape the bottom of the barrel. I want the best employees that I can possibly have, uh, but a salary. We have not been sour competitive with uh, private industry and even local governments. So we have lost a lot of people uh, that are not employed anymore. I've got 300 open positions. Uh, it was never more evident how bad that could be for the state of North Carolina than we, when we had the wildfires in the West this year. The one region that we had those wildfires, we were short 30 firefighters. What that meant in the case of a fire, the more folks you get there early and jump on it quick, the smaller it's going to be. We didn't have the people. So we actually had to call in firefighters from the West Coast to come in and help us fight that fire. This, that's not unusual in big fires, but uh, that initial attack and having uh, plenty of firefighters and equipment operators, it, it, you know, we were short and it showed. But that goes across the gamut in the department. Uh, lab technicians uh, in the new lab that we have. Uh, I can go on and on. And the, the good news is we're hiring some people. Uh, and I keep abreast uh, every week of how many people we've hired. And we'll hire 20 and lose 19. So we're, we're not gaining on it, but uh, I need you to help me recruit. We are upping those salary levels as the legislature gives, uh, gives us the ability to do, but it, it's getting critical and, and we're going to have to make that a priority to hire good people to work. Uh, I mean, it, it's unbelievable to me the opportunity that I've had to work with the type of people that I've worked with. Uh, Dr. Sandy Stewart just being one example. But uh, these are dedicated people that are making a difference every day, and I, I've got to have more of them. So you go out there and tell people, if you will, take a look at the Department of Ag, and please come and work for us. It, well, Commissioner, we have, um, we, we have a special guest that we're going to bring up in a moment. Um, but it just, you know, one final question. We, we've, obviously, we've covered a lot of ground, and we could do this for a long time. Um, but uh, but the next question is, uh, where do we go from here? What, what are the key points you want to see happen in agriculture moving forward? Well, you know, I think we've got to, first of all, look at every opportunity that uh, we can have in ag. And, and value-added processing is, is a good example. 
uh, active tourism is a, a very good example. But developing new crops for North Carolina, uh, we've got to continually take a look at that. We've got a, uh, a, a new crops program in the department where uh, we work with NC State and A&T to evaluate what could be the next potential crop for North Carolina. Now, at one time, we were a tobacco state. This was dominant, and I talked about the diversity. Uh, we've got that diversity, but we need more. There's no silver bullet that is going to replace what we used to have with tobacco. But that diversity, yes, we can be successful, and uh, we've got, uh, we're looking at uh, sesame uh, as a crop that comes to mind. I talked to uh, uh, a, a farmer yesterday. We've been looking at stevia for quite some time, and I had a farmer yesterday tell me that uh, he thought he had rounded the corner and been successful in producing stevia. So the, the partnerships and research will look for new crops. We have got to make sure that the policy that we have in North Carolina for agriculture is conducive to success. We have, we have those partnerships in place too. We've got a great legislature right now that has been very very good to work with as far as ag policy. Uh, but I, I want you to think about the changes that are going on in the state. We're going to have population changes, sure. Uh, we're going to have elections. And will the big cities sooner or later uh, take over dominance of the legislature and it makes it hard to educate uh, our legislators as, what, as to what good policy is? Uh, we've, got to, we've got to watch that. There's no question. So change is inevitable, uh, but adaptation to change makes you successful, and we've got to be nimble enough to be able to adapt and, and continue to play uh, to the local market, uh, to the national market, and to the international markets, and, and be able to market these products. And if you, if you heard uh, the professor of economics talk about, there is a difference in selling and marketing. Uh, and so we need to concentrate surely on marketing and not just selling a product and that experience that he talked about, that's the state of North Carolina. That's what we've got to sell with these products. So we've got to take advantage of it. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I, I started this out by, by pointing out the population growth in North Carolina. And, um, and we talk about some of the implications of that. But I think at the end of the day, if you're listening and you put together everything that you've heard the commissioner say, you realize that this population growth is going to also provide opportunity for agriculture. And, uh, and it may be opportunities that, that look a little bit different than today, but it really does provide opportunity. These people are going to have to eat. And y'all say it with me, hungry people are mean people, right? Um, I heard a, fellow, a really smart guy say that one time. But we do, we do have a special guest with us. Commissioner talked about, um, about relationships, and he talked about his, uh, his experience on a national level. And today we're, we're fortunate enough to have Secretary Mike Nagy from the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Secretary Nagy, welcome to the stage. Uh, 
uh, people who uh, tell me stories like, well, I looked around the neighborhood and I had, we had neighbors that had this issue, or uh, somebody in our community said, we've got this problem, and so we just built something uh, to address that. I see those same pieces here, and it's exciting uh, to, to be able to, uh, to do that. Now, now, this might be a, I don't think this probably is a surprise to folks, but th there is a little bit of rivalry between commissioners, secretaries, and directors, just a little bit. You know, I say sometimes it comes in the form of a, of a humble brag. Other times it's just flat out blatant bragging about your state. Uh, I happen to represent a very proud uh, agriculture state that occupies a leadership position in corn and, and, and pork and eggs and biodiesel and ethanol, number two in soybeans. And you know, I, I, agriculture is the number one driver of our economy. Guess what, does that sound familiar to somewhere else? Uh, when you think about the issues that, that, we, that confront us, right? Um, you know, workforce, uh, freedom to operate issues, uh, the overall health of our economy, access to capital. Uh, those are all the things that uh, really do unite us, especially North Carolina and Iowa, uh, as it relates to our livestock uh, industries and uh, the connection with a fair amount of grain that moves uh, east from the, the Midwest. I say we're, uh, we're compatible uh, and comparable in, in that. And uh, we're also collaborative. And so whether it's the food safety piece or even as I think about some of the other great challenges that we face in, in Commissioner and, and, and you and I both is uh, what about you know, pre preventing and responding to a foreign animal disease, you know, high path avian influenza, now the largest foreign animal disease outbreak in U.S. history is ongoing, but of course we're always thinking about African swine fever, foot and mouth disease, and how are we better prepared than we were yesterday to confront those things. And so we have a lot of uh, commonalities, uh, certainly. And I, I do think I've had a chance to travel uh, the world, as I know you have. I always like to say, you know, agriculture people speak the same language wherever you are in the world. And uh, that even includes a guy with an Iowa accent here in Raleigh. So, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, but, but it is so true uh, that you get farmers together or ag folks in a room together. I don't care if you're in Manila or Seoul or anywhere in the world. Uh, there are commonalities, and, and certainly that is a strength for us. You know, it really struck me, part of the conversation of, uh, gosh, we've all been through something the last couple of years that's been incredibly disruptive. Things happened that we didn't know could happen in this country, which is you went into a grocery store and you couldn't, you couldn't find some things, or you couldn't find things in the quantities that you wanted to, you know, something that we hadn't really thought about as a, as a country. And I've always prayed that one of the silver linings that could come out of that would be that people would have a better appreciation and understanding of where their, their food ultimately comes from, what it takes to get from the farm uh, to the plate. And uh, I see some, some bright spots, but then all too often I hear from farmers saying it sure does feel like uh, we're under attack. Uh, there's variations of this that I'm, I'm sure you, you've all heard, but it goes something like farming, the art of working uh, 400 uh, hours per month uh, losing while losing money, uh, all while trying to feed a consumer that thinks you're trying to harm them, right? And that's a long ways from the other bookend, which might be that famous Paul Harvey piece of So God Made a Farm, and, uh, and we fall somewhere in between. And so it just reminds us that uh, we really shouldn't take for granted that which we have here, and that is that there might be headwinds out there for us for agriculture, but I don't know about you, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world confronting those things but we shouldn't take it for granted. Policy matters, uh, investing in the future matters, investing in innovation, research, investing in the next generation, inspiring young people to get into agriculture. Uh, those are all things that we have to stay focused on and working at. Uh, so thanks for being a, a mentor to me, but uh, also you know, being a, a willing to as a group, as a North Carolina agriculture com uh, community to unite around those causes and really push forward. So uh, the cause is great, the demand is there. God willing, people need us three times a day, although we know uh, that not everybody gets that opportunity around the world. So uh, we've got work to do. And if somebody hasn't said it lately, by the way, thank you for what you do as agriculture people to meet that demand. So thanks for giving me such a warm welcome. Trade that goes on between Iowa and North Carolina, it's unbelievable. If you get caught in
his eyes on him and you want to get back to North Carolina, if you will just find a whole train car uh, load of corn, uh, just get on the back of it and the probability is he's coming here. Uh, and we've got trucks that run every day between North Carolina to Iowa that are uh, feeding out pigs. So if you walk over to Iowa, there's a, always a tractor trailer on the road headed that way. So we've got that, that connection. And, uh, we, we as stage partner, uh, when we have more disease outbreaks that we certainly don't want to have, but uh, high power avian influenza, we, we have been uh, brethren in fighting that. States do help one another when it happens, so we were happy to be able to go to Iowa and help out uh, when they have an outbreak, and I know if we need them, they'll be right here, so we have that camaraderie. Absolutely, and there's so much that we can uh, we can learn from each other by when we're stronger when we work together. We don't have to recreate all of that capacity between states, right? Then you, you share, and you, and you can leverage each other's experiences, but also resources, and that's just critically important that we're able to do. Uh, I think maybe I've had one experience that you haven't had, maybe. Uh, during COVID, uh, there were, and I talked about that uh, switching institutional food into the grocery store, and then it, it didn't happen overnight. Well, the way that we helped, uh, the department helped with that distribution was we worked directly with the processors and the integrators with truckloads of uh, protein primarily chicken and turkey, some pork. But the first thing we did, it, we did it at the farmer's market here in Raleigh. And uh, we had no idea what the public response was going to be to this. I mean, we're talking about a 30-pound box of chicken primarily, uh, bigger portions of chicken. So we took one tractor trailer to the farmer's market, put the word out, and it, you can't believe the response. You could not get to the farmer's market. So Zane and I were riding around trying to uh, figure out how to get there, and uh, they told us how it was going. So I said, well, call the markets and tell them to get two more loads of chicken coming to the farmer's market. So the response was so great. When these tractor trailer loads of chicken came in, they were escorted by the highway patrol, and there were used helicopters flying overhead. And I looked over at Zane and I said, this is the first time I've ever been to a chicken dinner. <laughs> Commissioner, it, that was, it, it's one of the more unusual days at work I've ever had uh, that day. But Secretary Day, thank you so much for being here. It's been an honor for us to have you. And, uh, and Commissioner Troxer, it's been an honor uh, for me to share the stage with you. And, and, um, and if you want to close us out with any final thoughts on this sector? Well, uh, I just thank you for being here today. Uh, I think it's evident to the people out here uh, why you were so successful in the department and now as the president of a college. And you can't believe the hurt uh, that I was experiencing when I knew that he was up for this job. But knowing the, the kind of person that he was and uh, the opportunity there, I actually helped him get the job all I could. And I'm proud to say that and, uh, uh, but replacing somebody like Sandy is not an easy job, but I've been able to do that with quality, with a quality person too. So uh, that's uh, that's what it takes. And the people in the department are what make the world go round in my world. And I've got a lot of employees here today and a very diverse uh, um, group of uh, divisions and stuff. So if you folks would stand up, uh, please can help me thank them work they do every day.
talk about how much international trade uh, is of value to us in agriculture, and uh, we're at 4.5 billion and growing, and determined to just keep growing and growing and growing that figure. Uh, 95% of the world's population lives outside uh, the United States, so that's where the market opportunity is. And our international marketing section is somewhere in the world, about every day, helping people sell these products uh, abroad. And uh, this year, we're going to award the Exporter of the Year, and uh, it's going to be Southern Distilling Company in Statesville. It's owned and operated by Pete and Vienna Barber. Uh, they produce high quality, local bourbon, rye whiskey, and brandy uh, that harkens back to the uh, city of Statesville rich to selling uh, history. Southern Distilling Company has been actively working with the international marketing team and the SUSDA export program for a number of years. And you can now find their products in Germany. And believe me, when I travel to a foreign country and I see a North Carolina product, boy, it makes me proud. In 2023, the company participated in the, the North Carolina and Tennessee Spirits Week and the North Carolina and Tennessee Spirit Sample Box activities in Berlin. They've also exhibited at the ProLine Trade Fair in Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf. Uh, this is the, Lord, the world's largest trade fair uh, for wines and spirits. Owners Pete and Vienna are entrepreneurs and innovators and draw from their extensive experiences in engineering and public health fields. They seek to honor the traditions of North Carolina distilling. <clears throat> Would that take moonshine? <laughs> uh, while putting their own mark on this legacy. Uh, one thing that I experienced, I was up there touring the place, and the, they use a lot of local input, inputs as much as they can. And the day that I was there, they were unloading a local load of uh, wheat to use in the distilling process, and they've got farmers around them that do produce the product for them. The company's award winning experience includes Southern Star Paragon Wheated Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Southern Star Standard High Rye, Bur High Rye Bourbon Whiskey, Southern Star Double Rye Whiskey, Southern Star Double Shot uh, Bourbon Cream Liqueur, and Honey Creek Bottle in Bond Straight what, Rye Whiskey. Among the specialty products line is the Carolina Panthers Limited Release Single Barrel Straight Wheated Bourbon, uh, this is in collaboration with the Carolina Panther. And another special product is the Southern Star Double Rye Whiskey. 50% uh, of the profits from the sale of this whiskey is donated to the Purple Hearts Home mission to create housing for disabled and aging veterans. Through <laughs> Through their efforts, Southern Distilling Company has become one of the largest privately owned distilleries in the country. Uh, it is on tap to have to more than quadruple production by 2025 and employ 50 people in their operation. Vienna has helped secure over 100, 100 contracted distilling clients as a part of the business model. Uh, Pete has provided us uh, contract services as new field barrel production, barrel warehousing, aging, and co -pilot. I was up there and was amazed at the, the product that they were producing for very high-end uh, bourbons uh, all across the United States. And if you see the, the magnitude of the operation they've got, it's just astounding. Right here in North Carolina. But beyond their business, Pete has also served as the president of the board of directors of the Still Association of North Carolina. And Vienna has been instrumental in lobbying for the North Carolina spirits industry to be able to sell liquor at retail locations on Sundays and the legalization of bottle sales at distilleries. 
So we are so proud to have them here in North Carolina and the work that they do. So I want to reward uh, Pete and Ann Carter and Southern Distilling Company the NCDA and CS Export of the Year Award.
And I've been impressed with the students and their passion and their understanding of agriculture. And I, uh, I can truthfully say the future is bright in North Carolina. The leadership talent is in the pipeline, so we're going to be fine. And today I'm pleased to uh, able to recognize a few of the talented young people that we do have in agriculture. I think you know how big our poultry industry is in, uh, in North Carolina. We have members of the 2023 National First Place Full Age Poultry Judging Team and their coaches, Dr. Barry Fosthoff and Ashley Brooks and Caleb Pope. So, uh, if they would come forward, I want to give them a, an award. And I'm going to slaughter some names so get prepared. Uh, we have uh, Elizabeth Peluso, Matthew Peluso, and Connor Howard, all with Craven uh, County 4-H. Uh, Therese Tessa Darnell of Halifax County 4-H. And I know we've got some proud family members here today, and I want to thank you for your work in helping to raise these uh, young adults that will be the future leaders in ag in North Carolina. This team took first place in the poultry judging at the 4-H Poultry and Egg Conference in Louisville, Kentucky back in November. This is quite an accomplishment, and this is the first time that North Carolina has ever had a team uh, that earned this first place. Uh, they also won three division and eight individual awards in the competition. So in recognition of these accomplishments, I'd like to present uh, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Ag All-Star Award to each team member for the hard work that they put in to be ready for competition, competition and representing North Carolina so well on the national stage. This Ag All-Star Award, All Award is presented in recognition of excellence and outstanding achievement in the field of agriculture, agribusiness, and agricultural education. You are the very first recipients of this award, and it is a privilege for me to be able to present you with it today. So thank you for your representation of North Carolina, and I will present you with your award. Thank you so much, Commissioner Troxler, for this um, chance and opportunity to recognize these young people that work so hard. And again, this is really, um, we can all take pride in this, is so the contest is traced back to 1929, but it seems like North Carolina didn't get an invitation until 1965. So this is the first time since 1965 that North Carolina is on that map. And so thank you, team, um, Craven County and Halifax County, that these youth, and they've been working at this so hard for so many years. It has been such a privilege to see them grow and develop. But this doesn't happen without the hard work of a lot of 4-H volunteers and extension agents. So that coach over there is top notch. That's our Craven County 4-H agent. And Beth Virtual, another great 4-H extension agent in the back. But um, we have a new leadership in our department, um, Dr. Frank Seward, new leadership in CALS um, with Dr. Gary Fox, and I'm really looking forward to what we can do together. So thank you for this opportunity, everyone.
that's our youth and the people that we are so proud of, and I thank them once again for the hard work that they have uh, put in. Greg Higgs, I think you're up. Right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Hicks, and I'm Assistant Commissioner for the North Carolina Forest Service. I'm pleased to introduce our next three speakers as they will bring news from new opportunities for North Carolina. First, we will hear from Jonathan Richardson, representing the NC Green Industry, followed by Laura Killian with North Carolina Farm Bureau, who will highlight an upcoming project for the agriculture industry. And finally, Mr. Ray Starlin with NC Chamber on its newest endeavor, our ag future. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I like you said, I'm Jonathan Richardson. I'm the president of the North Carolina Green Industry Council. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. We, we appreciate the, uh, the support and the friendship of the commissioner and uh, the department throughout the years to get us to where we are today as a continually growing industry here in North Carolina and a proud member of agriculture here. The Green Industry Council provides legislative advocacy network opportunities and education for our green industry community. Uh, our members include the Carolinas Irrigation Association, North Carolina Composting Council, the Urban Forest Council, North Carolina Urban Forest Council, North Carolina Sod Producers Association, Pine Needle Producers, and the North Carolina Turfgrass Council of North Carolina as well. So we are uh, we're excited to share ongoing efforts to highlight our economic impact uh, through the green industry in North Carolina. The North Carolina Green Industry Council is conducting a comprehensive economic impact study with NCSU. Uh, researchers Dr. Melinda Knuth and Dr. Uh, Daniel Traigo uh, will be conducting this study, which is actually live now. Hopefully, you have opportunities for those to come across and, uh, to, to support this efforts. Um, first, our first economic impact study was done almost 20 years ago. And at that time, 2005, it showed that our economic impact was about $8.6 billion. And that we employed over 152,000 employees. Obviously, uh, that's been a number of years ago. It's time to check back in. And our growth has got to be tremendous. So we're really excited to see those numbers and continue to add to the commissioner's uh, goal of well over $100 billion and try to keep pushing that harder as we continue to grow here in North Carolina. Uh, we're also uh, very grateful to the, the team of the NCDA. I uh, do want to highlight uh, with Weston and Corporal. We appreciate his guidance early on to kind of get us in this direction. Our board of directors of the, of the uh, NCGIC. And a special thanks to uh, Debbie Hamrick, an advisor of ours from the North Carolina Farm Bureau as well. Uh, she has always been there for us and continues to support. The purpose of this study is to analyze and qualify the contributions of the green industries of the, in the state of North Carolina, to update previous estimates of economic contributions in the state, to expand and impact and there's other market segments that weren't included in our 2005 study, and we look forward to see how that impacts moving forward and understand its impact at the state, regional, and county levels as well. Finally, the reports that are critical to our understanding and affected the issues of the green industry as well as the economy at large. The green industry remains an important contributor to North Carolina economy as well as the United States and regional. Our industry is extremely broad based with the, with the landscape services industry, wholesale, retail, trade sector existing in virtually all communities in the state of North Carolina. The North Carolina green industry community is comprised of firms involved in production, design, installation, maintenance, sales of plants, sod, and related goods and services to enhance the beauty and to protect our environment. So thank you for your attention on this matter. We look forward to the results. We appreciate the opportunity to be part of you and continue to grow and to show how much we're there. And thank you for your time today. 
Thanks. Good morning. My name is Laura Killian, and I am the Associate State Legislative Director at North Carolina Farm Bureau. Thank you for having me today. So I'm going to talk to you about a project called North Carolina Ag Leads. And it kind of clicked, so I'm just going to patient on the link. That's me. I already told you who I was. But this program is funded by the North Carolina Golden Leaf Foundation. And I'm trying to go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the Golden Leaf Foundation, this is their mission. And what we're going to do is talk about how it got started today. So, next slide. So, uh, maybe one of the easiest ways to explain this is to begin to tell you that this is not a public relations campaign. This is not a marketing campaign. And it's also not going to be a coffee table book. Uh, it's also not a public perceptions of agriculture campaign. We all get upset with consumers who don't know where their food comes from. But at the same time, this is a larger picture strategy. Okay? This is a strategic plan. A plan that will ultimately be a set of goals that everyone in the industry agrees upon. That's two things. Aspirational and attainable. So how do we get there? How it got started was with a man named Don Flo at the Golden Leaf Foundation. He's the chair. And he is not an Aggie. He is a uh, car salesman. He owns a bunch of uh, dealerships in the Triad. And he asked his, his board, uh, what is the future of agriculture as far as goals? Do, is there any um, strategic plan? They did a little research. And we all came together and basically said we all work together in times of need. Uh, but as far as working horizontally towards one goal and a lot of set of action plans, for lack of a better term. No, there's not. So we put together um, a team, but first I'll talk to you about the bigger picture of planning here. Um, next slide, please. So I don't want to go into details about how China works, but basically you know that's not how we work, right? So next slide. Uh, basically these are investments, uh, but however, let's go back to talking about how we don't do central planning very well here in the United States. And farmers historically are very independent. But it did, for example, take key thought leaders in the state to give us what we're capitalizing on today, like the community college system, like the Research Triangle Park, even the Golden Leaf Foundation itself. Basically, this is an opportunity for us as North Carolina agriculture to put the money where our mouth is and go to work for action. So this is a slide by Winston Churchill uh, talking about how plans are important. Now I will say this is Mr. Ray Starling's slides, um, but <laughs> planning is valuable. So let me show you another quote to think differently about this. Next slide, please. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And again, this is Ray's slides, and this was from 27 years ago. So I had asked Alexa who Mike Tyson was, um, and <laughs> she gave a really good response. Is anybody in here doesn't know? Um, but I know a lot of you farmers, you can relate directly to this quote. Uh, you plan every year, a hurricane can come, I'm like, yeah, I like that. Uh, so next slide, please. You might ask what this process looks like. Um, and I, I love having planning meetings. I mean, I know, uh, I talked to President Harding about it. I, I do love planning. I'm a super type A person. But let me tell you about the who first. Next slide, please. So Mr. Ray Starling, he's the general counsel at the chamber. And then myself and Sarah Grace Stan. Sarah Grace, please stand up. She is our superstar. She's our uh, project administrator, and she's going to be over here afterwards if you want to know more about the project. Next slide, please. The steering committee is comprised mainly of the funders, project funders, so Golden Leaf Board, uh, Commissioner Chocksler, Gary Salamito of the Chamber, and of course, President Sean Carty. Next slide, please. So again, these are Ray's slides, and he is a super smart guy, and I have not read this book, but allegedly this is what we're doing in this process. Um, and it, the book's called Essentialism. So if you want to read it, uh, there's apparently a lot of good ideas in the books. So let's, let's use an easier example. Next slide. Toy Story 2. I wanted to play a video, but I didn't have time. So basically, in Toy Story 2, there's a pig, a dinosaur, an action figure, Mr. Potato Head, and they're all trying to cross the road to get to the other side because they're trying to save the, oh, what's his name? Oh, they're trying to save Woody. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, 
they're trying to save Woody. But they all had to work together, and then there's someone that's always lagging behind. Um, it was the dog, but anyways, um, they work as a team. So that is the ultimate goal, is for all of us to work as a team. Next slide, please. So this is our timeline. We are currently in phase one, which is a phase of discernment. We are collecting data from the industry. Our steering committee wants this to be farmer focused, so at the grassroots level. And that is what we're doing. We're interviewing farmers and then agribusiness professionals and then those slightly outside of the ag sector next. Then we're gonna take a hard pause this summer. And then basically all that data collection will be categorized into buckets in phase two. So putting these common themes into action and we're going to have people in place to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, wait, go back one more. Okay, so I will tell you about the end goal of this project. I need you to lean in real quick. Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. And we in agriculture, specifically at the farmer level, are really good at getting better with less. I mean, in fact, you're the masters of it. And there are other out, others out there doing this exact same thing. And they want to tell you how to do it. They want to be driving the ship. And they are planning and plotting and hiring their own lobbyists. And they're not like being a lobbyist, in case you didn't know. Um, they're hiring their own lawyers who aren't like Ray. And they're hiring their own communications professionals. And they are really good at it. And they're convening and pursuing their own ideas about where this industry should be headed. Front page of the Wall Street Journal yesterday, farmer protests all over the EU. That policy historically trickles down here to, to the state level, historically speaking. So at the end of the day, Golden Leaf has given us the opportunity to assess all of that and more and see if we can actually agree on where we need to go. In phase two, figure out how to get there. So where are we trying to go? And that leads me to my next slide. This is our vision statement for the project. And please look at the last probably 10 words. Significantly strengthen the productivity, economic vitality, and community spirit of our sector. So hopefully you have gathered a little bit of information about this and ask yourself, ask your commodity group, ask your trade organization, because we can't do this as, as just individuals. Is this something where I want to go, somewhere where I would like for us to be, and am I willing to help get us there? And for your input today, one more slide, we it wouldn't be complete without taking a survey, so please scan the QR code, take the survey, and appreciate all of your help. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Ray. Well, thank you, Laura, and uh, good morning. Laura and I are also a part of that uh, Troxler alumni group that's been up this morning. Uh, it's like when you work for Commissioner Troxler, it's like Hotel California you can check out, but you can never really leave. Uh, and to echo part of what Laura said about not knowing who Mike Tyson was, she told me that story about asking Alexa, and I was like, who's Alexa? So, uh, you know, which, that's why we're good at working together. Uh, I want to tell you about a different project that also is involved at the Chamber, and I'll just quickly answer two questions. What are we doing, and why are we having to do it? So this is separate and different from the strategic plan. It is a program that's designed to build some grassroots and grass tops interest in what I describe as the rise of the federal administrative state. Uh, why is that needed? Well, I'm not sure you've noticed, uh, but Congress seems to have a hard time these days solving really big problems, right? It seems to be really hard to get people on the same page there. That atmosphere, combined with a nonprofit advocacy community that is increasingly anti-production agriculture, and is well financed and is well counseled and lawyered, that has empowered not Congress, but the courts and the executive branch rulemakers to act largely unchecked. In fact, this problem's gotten so bad that this year's winner of the Export Award is a bourbon company, right? I mean, that's the only way we're making it here. Free rounds for everybody. If you agree, that we should set our own policies, that we can look out for our own industry, and that we should really define and determine our own destiny. If you agree with that, if you've noticed what I'm talking about with regard particularly to the federal government, if you think there
there is something wrong with a federal agency being the lawmaker, the police, and the judge and the jury, then I hope you'll join us in what we're doing with our ag future. Visit Sydney Laughlin, who will be at the same booth as Sarah Grace over to our right as we break for lunch. Uh, we're sharing booth space. That's some of that ag efficiency. Uh, so remember the two different programs that we're working on. One, helping the state design a strategic plan for agriculture, and then our ag future, ensuring we actually are not regulated out of implementing that plan. And as a freebie today, if you're willing to share your email with us over at the booth, uh, we have these bumper stickers. Now, the commissioner has mentioned a couple times the tobacco industry still important to this state. And you may remember many years ago, we had these that said, North Carolina has pride in tobacco. We reprinted them, and we put the word still in there. We still have pride in tobacco. Come by and get one of these. I'm going to put one Pretty good there. Maybe not, but I'm leaving it. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. We'll see you over at the booth uh, during lunch. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Ray and Laura, for that, for that update. I'm Caleb Rathcon, Services Assistant Commissioner in Western North Carolina, and I'm honored to uh, bring up the, the next panel uh, to discuss a very important topic to our state. Uh, so I would, uh, I would say that there's not a person in this room that hasn't been affected in some way by, by flooding and water issues in North Carolina over the last several years. I know in my community, in Western North Carolina, we've dealt with flooding and tropical storms. The has been involved in, in every major event. Uh, to help agriculture uh, bounce back. And so we're very fortunate to have experts in this field uh, here in North Carolina. Look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Mike Birchall, uh, Dr. Barbara Dahl, Dr. Muhammad Youssef, and Dr. Bill Hunt. And I'll turn it over to our moderator, Keith Larry, with North Carolina Farm Bureau. Hi, everybody. Um, so we all know that, you know, what, what the state is experiencing flooding issues and you know they, they seem to be getting worse whether it's climate driven or due to impervious surface from all the people moving in um, you know whether it's hurricanes or storms that just dump a few inches in an hour or two and cause local issues uh, our legislature has really been paying attention to this issue lately they've put a lot of funding into this issue um, our, our state agencies and groups like farm bureau are really working on these issues as well Today we've got four experts from the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at NC State University. They've really been doing a lot of work on flood mitigation, stormwater management, kind of water management on the landscape issues. And um, we're a little short on time, so I'm just going to hand it over to the experts and let them go. And I believe Dr. Barbara Dahl is up first. And I am getting worried about those angry, hungry people. Uh, cannibalism is, it was a thing, so. <laughs> We'll try to make it quick, but we prepared some good information for you. We've had three major storms that took place in about a 20-year period that caused billions of dollars of damage, it damaged thousands, tens of thousands of homes, and we had a lot of emergency rescues that were taxed our local communities. Next. Sorry, my point is ringing as well. <laughs> And um, traditional approaches to address this flooding have really focused on impounding large volumes of water, building levees to barricade that water out. And we found that these are very high costs. There's a lengthy process to get those designed, constructed, permitted, built. And they're high risk, so if there's a failure, it can be very catastrophic for these types of systems. So more recently, we've been hearing conversations about natural infrastructure or nature-based solutions. How can we use these more lower risk type of approaches that might provide other benefits as well as dealing with flooding? Things like wetland and stream restoration or floodplain expansion, uh, reforestation, and some of the ag practices we've been doing for conservation as well. And so we have a group here that works in the water management sector, and we have been working on resilience. And so we want to share with you some of the work we're doing that's focused on resilience on the farm as well 
Gulf is in that rural, rural watershed. We all drive on roads and live in communities. So how can we do work on the farm that may help the bigger watershed? As well as really taking a look at that natural infrastructure and what we can get out of it to help this problem. And we, we're a growing state, so we have a very ever-changing interface between the urban and rural environment. And so how are we going to maintain the resilience in these areas as well? So I'm going to turn it over next to Dr. Yusuf. And pass me this. OK, so uh, our next um, basically is going to demonstrate something in our practice that we are working on to basically uh, increase the climate resilience, uh, the increase the environmental sustainability, and make our crop production system more uh, profitable, more productive, and more resource, effi resource efficient. So uh, this practice is, is what we're referring to as on-farm local storage and reuse. And I'm gonna share with you some of these benefits for the crop yield, for the uh, environmental uh, benefits, and also for the potential for uh, crop, uh, flood mitigation. So what, what this... Uh, okay, so what this, this practice is, um, any uh, season we have with have wet periods and then we have dry periods for the growing season. So what uh, what we're doing, what we're, what we're proposing is to store uh, to store the uh, agricultural runoff in uh, on farm ponds or uh, reservoirs. That this water can later on be used as a source for supplemental irrigation during the dry the dry periods or the growing season. As we will see in the next few slides. This practice has a lot of benefits. Okay, so let me get uh, get started with the crop yield benefits. In uh, I'm showing you the, the the results for two growing seasons in 2022 and 2023 for corn here. Uh, in 2022, we have a very dry June. In 2023, we have a very dry July. And I'm going to tell you, uh, basically, it's going to be almost like this. Every growing season, you're going to have maybe a couple of uh, weeks with not much water in coming from rain. So in 2022, we irrigated corn and we applied only 3.5 inches, 3.5 inches of supplemental irrigation. And the result was more than double the crop yield. More than double. This is, this is a huge uh, return on investment. In 2023, same thing. We had a dry spill in July, applied a, about 4.5 inches of supplemental irrigation. We got 60% increase in corn yield. You can see the difference between the ears of the irrigated corn and the non-irrigated corn. This is what is make, making difference in the yield. Uh, so this is not here. Okay. Okay. This is not only for corn. It is for uh, cotton as well. In the same growing season in 2023, we have uh, dry spill in. July, you can see the yield of the cotton, of the irrigated cotton, as the picture, and the non-irrigated cotton. We have increased of 83% of the lent yield for the irrigated cotton as well. Now, this is not the only benefit. So we are, we are achieving this high benefits of the, of the crop yield, but at the same time, this practice is highly efficient in capturing 
the nutrients and the sediment before it reaches the downstream surface water bodies. So it will reduce the nitrogen by 40 to 50 percent. It reduces the phosphorus losses by 35 to 70 percent, and it almost captures all the sediments before the agricultural runoff reaches the surface water bodies. Next. So this practice also has an additional benefit, which is uh, the uh, flood mitigation potential. So if you, uh, so if this, this is a picture of one of the pumps, the irrigation pumps that we're monitoring. It is like this at the beginning of the season, full, filled with water that can be used for supplemental irrigation. Near the end of the growing season, you will see most of the water is consumed for, sub, for the irrigation. Now, this empty pond would be ready to store some of the storm water that is coming from the extreme event. So this would be the pond filled with water coming from the, uh, this, the extreme event. The overall effect of that, if we apply, next slide please, if we apply this at a large scale, we have oh, uh, over 2.4 million acres of agricultural land in the three main river basins in North Carolina. So this would have the effect of modulating the effect of uh, the, uh, the increased, or um, I mean here, it will reduce the peak flow and store the water in the agricultural land scale and make agriculture a good contributor to basically the resiliency of uh, these coastal systems. And uh, with this, I will, I will uh, give it to uh, Barbara. Uh, so building off what I introduced about natural infrastructure, we've done a lot of studies looking at kind of where we can put this on the landscape and what are the benefits of that. We did a very detailed study on the middle new space and working with a number of partners. And we focused on three of these natural infrastructure practices. Reforestation, taking low productivity cropland and converting that, not your most productive. We looked at well and restoration, but adding a flood storage component to that, so area to hold water. And we also looked at a new concept called water farming that has been done in Florida. Water farming is where you berm around a crop or ag field, and you put in water control structures at the ditch points where it leaves. That system remains open most of the time. It's being farmed, the gates are open, the water's blowing out. But if we have a storm coming, you close the gates, store that water, and then you wait for the flood peak to dissipate downstream after three to five days, and then you release that water. So this is, um, we looked at throughout the Middle News and found the best places for that were in the lower coastal plain where we have flatter landscapes. And that center bottom map shows the watershed for Bear Creek, one of our detailed study watersheds. And you can see colored in all the different opportunity areas we found for those three practices. And when we modeled the watershed with those practices, we found that we could, in combination with all those, get to about 20% reduction in the peak flow of a Hurricane Floyd event for that watershed. So that was a substantial benefit, but it took a lot of practice. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the project, we work with our partners to do some gauging of this opportunity to landowners to see how open they would be to it. Um, there was a workshop held, a survey was conducted that reached 156 people responded to that, 124 of those were farmers, and we did quite a bit of economic analysis. And some of the findings quickly, we found that 69% of those farmers surveyed had experienced some flooding, and it affected on average 30% of their farm. 40% of the farmers had lost some yield, had lower yield and delayed harvest as a result of wet conditions as well. We also proposed different leasing options for them, and they preferred a 30 year upfront on that if they were to enroll in a program to do this. And they would also need to be paid for damages. We estimated that four times in 30 years, you're gonna have to close the gates and flood it, it'll be a loss. 
and they would be paid for those damages. Um, for wetlands, the flood control wetlands, they would have to be purchased, these lands, because they would be completely out of production. And forced conversion would take an investment by the state to give them the adequate returns on that investment. But we did find the farmers had land that they were willing to enroll in such a program. Next slide, please. The other thing, they requested some demonstration projects to look at this to figure out how it would really work. So we have secured funding from the Land and Water Fund. We're building a project at the Caswell Research Farm in Kinston. We're going to berm around 15 acres of cropland. We're also digging one of Muhammad's ponds. And we're going to use that pond uh, digging to get the berm material. And that pond will serve as irrigation as well. And so we're going to compare that field that we flood to a field ne right next to it we don't flood. And look at all those things of water quality, quantity, crop productivity. And look closely at some of these compensation packages that may occur. Next slide. Not only have we been looking at water stored on the farm, we have also done a lot of hydraulic analysis to look at water as it leaves the farm and travels through ditches and channels, and to look at the effect of debris. This is kind of one of the more traditional approaches we have is addressing debris. And what we've seen is that if we have a really wide floodplain compared to the channel, you can have a lot of debris in there, and it really makes very little difference in flood flows. However, if you have a narrow floodplain compared to the channel, then you could have 25% blockage and that would start to cause some problems with flooding. At bridges and structures, you can, in contrast, you can have as little as 20 to 30% and risk overtopping the road. So really focusing that removal on those bridges and in the areas where it's more confined. Now, with storms, we get a lot of debris to wash in, including a lot of man-made materials, so it's really important to get that out. Another part of our modeling showed that in many of the reaches we looked at, there was undersized culverts and bridges that were causing much more of a backwater and flooding effect than any of the debris in the streams. So it's important that we also look at those types of structures for considering making changes there. We also recommended considering more permanent changes such as stream restoration, where they actually expand the floodway, or just continuing like we've been doing to get the vulnerable structures out of the floodplain. Next slide. Oh, I'm okay. going to pass it on to Dr. Burton. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to step back for a moment and, and talk a little bit more about natural infrastructure. Um, we've, we've been doing demonstration of natural infrastructure, of course we didn't always call it that, but areas uh, like uh, buffer, vegetated buffers, uh, and constructed wetlands, and uh, how they would actually build resiliency in the watershed and in um, agricultural facilities. And uh, we found that, that they do build resiliency, particularly if you do it in a strategic manner. And what I mean about strategic, well, it's pretty simple, you know, with, with uh, wetlands, you know, you want to maybe focus on the areas where the, the water and the runoff is going to be and where the flood, flooded areas are going to be. And uh, in particular, you know, you want to preserve your best farmland also. So you ought to want to really focus on these areas uh, that are in and around some of your less productive, uh, aka wetter areas around the farm. Uh, next slide. So I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, projects that we uh, had the good fortune to be able to work and design, uh, provide construction oversight and do monitoring uh, over the years. And uh, one of the, the first projects that I want to share with you is in Carteret County at North River Farms. Uh, the idea here was to restore wetlands in an agricultural watershed and uh, with the idea that if we move water through these areas, maybe we could uh, really improve the water quality in the downstream coastal waters. And so the design included a diversion of agricultural drainage from the farm to the north, uh, and we needed to move that in there to, to support the wetland. In doing so, you know, the water moving through there not only supported the wetland, but added flood resiliency and uh, improved the water quality of that water making its way down into the estuary. And, very importantly, uh, our observations and modeling showed that the diversion of that water from the big canal that was draining the farm to the north actually added drainage capacity to that farm during large storm, uh, uh, storm events. Next slide. 
Uh, the second uh, project that I wanted to share with you is in Hyde County um, at Lux Farms, just south of the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, if you've ever been there, you know that farmland is, a lot of the farmland there is at or below sea level. And so that the way that they deal with the excess drainage water is that they usually pump to the lowest area, and that area down there is taking that drainage water into the Pamlico Sand. And so all of the ag practices in that area have really made the wetland areas there uh, drier than historically and actually moved water in a direction uh, different than it used to, to flow, and in this case, to the north. And so the project involved diverting that water using uh, uh, pumps and diversions into the wetland areas uh, to rewet these historical wetlands. But in doing that, it actually gave the farm additional drainage capacity. You know, over the last 10 years, they've had a lot of flooding concerns down there. So it gave them an extra outlet to move that water into when they have big storms. Um, and our, our studies actually showed that because we're moving that water into the wetland areas, rather than the Pamlico Sound, the Pamlico Sound was actually getting 60% less drainage water than it normally did. And so that improved the water quality of the Pamlico Sound. Uh, and as we move that fresh water north, um, we hope that the uh, saltwater intrusion that the farmers have been observing coming south from, through the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge to the north there, moving south, uh, would stop some of the, um, the saltwater intrusion. Uh, and last but not least, moving that uh, slugs of fresh water into that direction uh, actually rewets a lot of the coast and wetland areas in the, in the refuge and uh, that reduces significantly the potential for peat fires that they have had in those areas. So I hope these examples kind of uh, show you a good example of how this natural infrastructure can result in some win-wins for both the watershed and for the uh, agricultural facilities. So I want to pass it on to uh, Dr. Hunt. Thank you, appreciate going to the next slide. So Commissioner Troxler really set me up great today uh, because we talked about how North Carolina's growing, and growing really fast, either third or fourth, fastest growing state. And as a result, our watersheds are often combinations of both urban and rural land uses. And uh, Keith asked me right off the bat to say, why don't you let folks know what the state, what's already going on in the realm of urban flood mitigation. And for a long time, since the 90s and cases into the 80s, a lot of cities are what we'd say, in the engine, this is all engineering speak, y'all, we're mitigating the five inch storm, right? And what we mean by that is, we look at how much flooding would have occurred before we developed, and then after we developed, we limit that flow rate to be exactly what it was before we developed. So, um, so that's one of the things that we're doing, and, and that's not impacting the Florences and the Dennises and the massive amounts of rain, but certainly when a hurricane hits Florida and then comes up here and drops three and a half inches, we are doing something with that. The second thing that the state of North Carolina, DEQ specifically, tasks is that in developed areas, they have to either capture an inch of rain, or if you're at the coast, how many all are from the coast drove up today, Coastal County? Well, you have to catch a little more rain down the coast, about an inch and a half. Um, and, and that is for water quality improvement. By, by, but by putting practices in that are capturing an inch or an inch and a half of runoff, you are having some positive benefit also with flood mitigation. Um, and when we talk about practices, there's all sorts of names for them. I mean, the overall is called the stormwater control measure. It sounds pretty fancy. But things like ponds and wetlands and rain gardens and fire retention, that's what's being used here. Next slide, please. In addition to what uh, is, is happening from a peak flow and flood mitigation standpoint, the legislature passed a really important rule in 2020 that enabled nutrient management trading from stormwater devices. That's a pretty big deal. So now you can do things in an urban landscape that would help remove nitrogen, but when you also help them remove nitrogen, you are able to mitigate some flooding. And it's, it is a market, it's a nutrient market. And as a result, you're seeing the potential for trading between urban and rural land uses to try to keep nitrogen down but at the same, and phosphorus, but at the same time, you're also potentially improving flooding. Next slide, please. So one of these types of practices that gets put in can be, uh, as a conjunctive wetland, can be really, really big. This one's down in Newburn. Um, it, it's a 25-acre practice proper. It treats seven and 800 acres. And I see David Hardy here. David, we actually started this a long time ago when we were working down in, in Craven County. It took a while for it to get built. But long story short is we're treating 
runoff from urban and rural areas with this one very large constructed well. We're doing this again right now in Wilson, and the, the, the uh, tweak now in Wilson is using automated controls, real-time controls, so we can actually predict when rains are coming, so we can lower the water level in ponds and reservoirs in advance of storms and get that water out so we can create capacity in these really big, uh, really big uh, impoundments. Again, constructed wetlands, what we might call them. And then the last thing I want to talk about, next slide, last slide, is that uh, how many of y'all, my show of hands, drove here today? I know the answer is going to be okay. That's me checking to see who's still awake. Okay. Uh, and, and Commissioner Troxer talked about that today, about how the drive and the, and the, and the transportation infrastructure is, does need to be improved, all right? Well, NCDOT is perfect, you know, is aware of this as well. And on the stormwater side, they are investing in modeling different types of scenarios where if you can build practices larger to begin with, maybe it will reduce the cost of repairing them, or maybe more importantly, increase the likelihood that they work when we have one of those extreme events that causes flooding, all right? And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, there's a little, you can just Google that. I can't read it, but y'all can. You can Google it. It's an eight-minute video that was produced by PBS. I encourage y'all to watch it. Now, with that, I want to thank uh, on all of our behalf. We really appreciate being invited. It's an honor to be here. And uh, with that, I guess it's about lunch. Thank you. We are so appreciative of the opportunity to support this event. If you will, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for all your many blessings. Um, we are so appreciative that we were able to travel to Raleigh safely today and just pray for travel mercies as everyone heads back to their families later this afternoon. Dear Lord, I'm just grateful for each and every one in this room and the special and important role that they play within the agricultural community. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to live in such a wonderful country, and we just thank you for those that protect us on a day-in, day-out basis. I thank you for the farmers that prepared the food that we'll enjoy this evening, this afternoon, and I thank you for those that prepared it. Dear Lord, please take this food and nourish our bodies and our bodies to your service. In your son's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. served as a buffet and I believe it's behind the curtain and that general direction is where the line will form. So thank you so much. <laughs> 